Okay, welcome then to the August 27th Select Board meeting. We are going to get started. Ms. Brewer is going to be probably about 15 minutes late, according to the text message we just got from her. Um, this is our first regular Select Board meeting since July 16th, so our agenda is absolutely jam-packed with things to do. Um, so we are going to get started now. This meeting is called to order at 8.33. Six. Oh, six. That would be 6.33, not 8.33. <laughs> That's right, Did it's going it to be a long night. I'm, I'm already in the time <laughs> yeah. of the meeting. Good. I'm anticipating our late night already. Okay, uh, we're going to start with public comment, and we have Ms. Stender as our first speaker here. If you could come forward and introduce yourself for folks at home, please. Absolutely. Good evening. I'm Kimberly Stender. I work in the office of the superintendent of the Amherst Public Schools, and I'm here this evening on the invitation of Ms. O'Keefe to speak about our first day celebration, which is this Wednesday. August 29th and if you don't mind I'd like to read just a statement I have so all the details are included for everyone to hear. The Office of the Superintendent is once again partnering with the Greater Amherst Community, local businesses, college and service organizations to celebrate our students and staff as the new school year begins. <coughs> the third annual first day celebration on the Amherst Town Common is scheduled for Wednesday August 29th from 530 to 7 p.m. The sole purpose of this free event is to foster community spirit and demonstrate enthusiasm and commitment to the education of our students. The first day celebration provides an opportunity for the entire community to gather in a unified show of support for our public schools. In past years, residents, town officials, school committee members, and leaders from higher education have attended. Superintendent of Schools Maria Garrick will welcome everyone and students will have the opportunity to meet their school principals and teachers. Families will enjoy arts and crafts, sports clinics led by collegiate athletic teams, and safety demonstrations by the Amherst Fire and UMass and Amherst College Police Departments. Entertainment will be, be provided by the Amherst Regional Middle School 8th Grade Chorus under the direction of Dave Rainin, and Grupo Folklorico Tradiciones will perform dances from Latin America. The Amherst Lions Club is providing their site mobile for free vision exams and Family Outreach of Amherst in partnership with the Amherst Public Schools and the Town of Amherst is unveiling the new community van. In addition, many of our community partners, uh, about 20 in total, will have tables set up on the common to distribute programming and lit event literature. Businesses experience increased foot traffic on this evening and we're proud to uh, tell our guests to visit local restaurants, and bring a picnic <coughs> dinner to enjoy on the common. Um, if it does rain, which it's not in the forecast, our rain location will be at Amherst Regional High School cafeteria, same date and same time. And we are very grateful to, for the support the town of Amherst has shown us um, for this event and in the past when we do the first day celebration. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for coming in to uh, to encourage the community to be part of that. Uh, it's something that many of us have attended the last couple of years, and it just has a wonderful vibe. There's really nothing more exciting than back to school for kids, and uh, so I encourage folks to attend. It's really a lovely event. Thank, Thank you very you. much for tuning Thank in. Thank you. I look forward to seeing all of you there that evening. Great. All right. Other folks here for public comment? Mr. Elsasser? My name is Bill Elsasser uh, of the Ann Whalen. Uh, I, I wondered if it might be possible for uh, technical difficulties to be worked out prior to the ripping up of significant parking facilities in town, uh, such as the town hall uh, facility downstairs, which I have uh, been told is awaiting certain technical remediation or parts. It seems to me that a, a venue as significant as the town hall should not go for months on end with uh, a ripped up uh, parking facility. I don't know if I'm alone in that perspective, but I think it would, uh, it would behoove the town to plan more carefully uh, in terms of uh, performing these, uh, these projects. Number two, my friend and former uh, Housemate Colette Foster is terminally ill in the Fisher home, and I think sh I, I think she would appreciate some recognition of her long service and presence in the town of Amherst. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for coming in and thank you for the information about Ms. Foster. We wish her the very best. Um, just for your information, Mr. Musanti will be giving a construction update later in the meeting, so mm -hmm. he'll be talking about that parking lot and other places. Uh, anyone else for public comment? No. Okay. Then we will get a couple of untimed items out of the way. We've got seven minutes before our <coughs> our uh, first public hearing starts. Uh, let's see. What can we do easily? We can do the parking and street closure requests. Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve the reservation of 10 parking spaces on the west side of Boltwood Avenue, beginning at the southwest corner of Spring Street, beginning at 5 a.m. September 7, 2012, to 4 p.m. September 8, 2012, to facilitate drop-off and pickup of sale items from the Amherst Survival Center's annual trash to treasures furniture fundraiser. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous, four to zero, one absent. Aye. Next one. I move that the select board approve the request from the Amherst Family Center to bag 35 parking spaces between College Street and Spring Street on the west side of Boltwood Avenue and to the east side of South Pleasant Street as marked on the attached map on Friday, September 28, 2012, beginning at 9 p.m. through 10 a.m. Saturday, September 29, 2012, and to continue to bag up to five <coughs> meters to accommodate vendors with handicapped parking permits until 5 p.m. Saturday, September 29, 2012, for the annual Apple Harvest Festival. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that was unanimous, four to zero, one absent. Let's do our taxi licenses. Okay. I move that the select board approve a new taxi chauffeur license for Benjamin Sullivan of Amherst and one for Jose Rivera of Florence on behalf of a Aaron's Taxi. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Four to zero. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Lynette Barber Fuller of Leverett on behalf of Gotta Go Taxi. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Uh, Mr. Wald. Yep. Just for that to end. I'm looking on the <laughs> form. It looks like uh, both are at the place for bad. No. <laughs> are both Thank you. Barbosa. Because the bottom line that you're supposed to look like a vehicle to the bottom line. The top one looks like a bag right now. I think we are approving the license for Lynette Fuller. And <laughs> 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 they will take it. Yeah. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, so whatever the corrected name is, since yeah. we can't know for certain. Like another one on it. Yes, yeah. Lynette <laughs> Fuller, as amended. All right, uh, and we already voted on that. Okay, so that uh, is all set. Special licenses? Uh, yes. Before you do, if I could just say, um, Amherst Media, if you could possibly tweak the speakers in here so it's a little bit louder uh, coming, uh, the, the uh, audio from our mics w to the speakers in the room so that people in the audience can hear us better. And it helps <coughs> us speak into the mics better when we get the better feedback that is telling us we're speaking into the mics. Okay. Ms. Stein, go ahead. Okay. I move that the select board approve special wine and malt licenses for each reception scheduled on the following dates and premises of the UMass Amherst campus listed below, Meredith Schmidt Campus Center Director, September 4th, 2012 from 6 to 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. at Dorothy Gardens, September 5th, 2012 from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Fine Arts Center Gallery, September 7, 2012, from 4 to 5.30 p.m. at Conti Building. September 7, 2012, from 3.30 to 6 p.m. at Eisenberg Atrium. October 4, 2012, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. at Du Bois Library. October 5, 2012, from 7 to 9 p.m. 
at Balgar Auditorium. October 11, 2012, from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. at Fine Arts Center. October 22, 2012, from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. at Fine Arts Center. November 1, 2012, from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. at the Fine Arts Center. November 8, 2012, from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. at the Fine Arts Center. November 15, 2012, from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. at Balgar Auditorium. November 18, 2012, from 6 to 9.30 p.m. at Balgar Auditorium. And December 1, 2012, from 7 to 10 p.m. at Balgar Auditorium. Second. And if it were up to me, I'd put a the in front of all the cases where it says the Fine Arts Center, since it's I, I in half of them anyway. Put up, put and it up to it's much Got it. Okay, Mr. Hayden. I appreciate Scott getting all of those ready for us. I, I Scott and, and Deborah. Indeed. And uh, and the uh, folks at UMass for planning ahead that and way. And that planning that it, yes, keeps indeed. us from having. Uh, er, it lowers our likelihood of having to have a quickie special license meeting. So that's really terrific. <coughs> All right, it's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Ms. Brewer has joined us. Welcome. All right, what time is it now? It is 6.44. All right, so we'll get started with our public hearing because it'll take us a minute to get everything ready here anyway. Um, we have two different public hearings tonight for utility poles, and we have Mr. Chudzik from Western Mass Electric here with us this evening. Um, we have these timed separately, so unfortunately we have to talk about them separately because um, that's just the way it goes. One of them had already been advertised at the time of the, uh, when the, the second one came in. So the first one is for Chestnut Street, and this public hearing is opening at 6.45 p.m. I will note that all of the relevant materials for this are in our select board packets, which are also available to folks online. So welcome, Mr. Chudzik, and uh, tell us about the Chestnut Mr. Street Hayden, Thank you. Okay, the first request on Chestnut Street is a uh, request by the uh, a person that lives um, at that residence that they were taking down a tree which we had used as an anchor guide before. So because of that, now we have to put a tree to su give support for the line on the south side of the street. Okay. So, and I understand, I guess, um, it's already the uh, town manager uh, of the highway department has already seen the site, so he's in agreement with this. Yes, it has full recommendations from town staff yes. um, to proceed with this. Um, questions from select board about support, Mr. Hayden? Uh, two, a complaint and an appreciation. Uh, the appreciation first, I, this, I've never noticed the, um, that on these stub poles that you set aside a spot for municipal services. I, I don't think the fire alarm is carried on wires anymore, but I appreciate that there's a spot on this pole reserved for them. And the complaint, um, once again, I, I didn't have time to actually go and look okay. at this pole, which I would have had to, to learn whether or not the dot that's shown n near the middle of the street is in fact not. It's off the street, it's near the sidewalk or, or whatever. I'm just gonna rely on our staff for having, having done that right. There are mapping services available on the town website that would make this much, much more clear much to us. Much clearer, okay. And that's, 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 um, that's okay. And I, I won't say that the second time because it's, it's also a problem, so. Is it right of way? Hmm? It's in the right of way, yeah. but I can't uh -huh. tell if it's on the pavement or not from this, so. Okay. Have you been, I don't know if you've been over to Chester Street, you can see what actually where the stakes. Not recently enough okay. to, to right, uh, the stakes are there. To, I didn't have, I didn't okay. get a chance, so. If you, yeah, if you want, right. Had any <coughs> further discussion on that. Okay, so Mr. Hayden, you're, you're happy to rule on this without having that exact location? I'm going to rely on the, the folks that, that I often rely on for, for things in the Department of Public Works, so. Very good. Other questions or comments from Mr. Chudzik about the Chestnut Street poll? Anyone from the public like to comment on the Chestnut Street poll? All right, then I uh, move to close the public hearing at 6.47 I would move to close the hearing. All in favor of closing the public hearing at 6.47, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Deliberation. Poll, Chestnut Street. Sounds yeah. good. Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. 
I move that the select board approve the joint petition of Western Massachusetts Electric Company and Verizon New England Incorporated to locate one jointly owned poll number 19-2S-T2-2 on the north side of Chestnut Street, approximately 285 feet easterly from the center line of East Pleasant Street in accordance with the field plan number 6A220224 submitted upon petition said poll necessary to serve as a guy stub poll second to, al to allow for removal of tree guy okay. uh, i Sec have to confess Se my giggles are because i have no idea there's no uh, what a guy criminal stub activity poll is, involved in that motion. i would like to know <laughs> yeah. before i vote <laughs> can i can i ask to define that for me before <laughs> I vote the motion on it. seconded first. Second. <laughs> All right. Further discussion. Mr. Chudzik, about the guy stub poll definition. <coughs> I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, Ms. Stein would like a definition of a guy stub poll. Guy stub poll. Okay. What it is is a poll that's used for anchoring the poll line on the opposite side of the street. So it's an anchor, basically. That's what a guy stub poll is. Okay. Thank you. See, we learn something new every day here at the Select Board. Right. All right, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you. All right, 649. So we're going to say that is the same as 650, and we're going to move ahead to our 650 poll hearing, and I will talk just until we get to 650. So the 650 poll hearing is similar. Um, this is for a poll placement on Sunderland Road. This is going to serve, uh, in particular, the uh, new survival center survival whose construction center, is just going along gangbusters it's quite extraordinary what's going on there and it is now 650 so we will open this public hearing mr chudzik okay um on sunderland road, road the service or we should say that our distribution line is actually on the uh, easternly side of the street so in order to provide the service on the westerly side of the street we're going to set a pole feet overhead and they're going to attach with a uh, feet on the ground with a riser to our overhead service wires that's coming over. This is that's basically what we're doing here. Very well. Questions or comments from Select Board? Uh, Mr. Hayden. Yes. Yeah, so welcome back, Mr. Chuzik, okay. by the way. Uh, we, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I think we may have scared Matt away or something because he was here and hasn't been back since, but any event. Um, that's all. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> just giving you a hard time complaint. tonight. But I only made it. So well, all right. Other questions or comments from Slackman? One question I have. Okay. What is this sketch or something you want to something you have on your online system? You check out check out amherstma.gov. Which I do. Click on the GS GIS, GIS. property information top one in the yeah. second yeah. menu, and there's all kinds of wonderful stuff there. Okay. And and we'll look at okay. So. All right. We'll put um, uh, Miss Roussel uh, from the Select Board Office in touch with you. Most of our most of our requests that have anything to do with parking or anything to do with the public way come in on these GIS maps, and sometimes the Select Board Office creates them, and sometimes oh. the applicant creates them. So instead of having to draw out kind of an approximation of the roadway, uh, uh, it's extremely it's exact. And yeah. Makes your life easier too. Okay. All right. Uh, further questions or comments from the Select Board? Questions, close questions or comments from the public about the Sunderland Road poll? <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, select Board, Ms. Brewer. I, I didn't say it before, that just again, that we didn't get any comments, obviously, that we have these long, we have these long abutter lists that we always have to send things, that things are sent to, and once again, we have not received any comment that way. So. Correct. And, uh, and also, I take this opportunity to uh, appreciate Ms. Roussel's efforts in moving this along. This, uh, this was something she kind of hand carried through the process with the utility companies to enable us to deal with this tonight. So uh, <coughs> many thanks again to Ms. Roussel, who makes us look good in so many ways. Yes. All right, Mr. Hayden, now a motion to I close public to hearing. I move to close public hearing. And a public hearing, and the motion is to close public hearing at 652. All in favor, say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Deliberation by select board. Poll, poll, Sunderland Road. Sounds good. Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? I move that the select board approve the joint petition of Western Massachusetts Electric Company and Verizon New England Incorporated to locate one jointly owned poll number 
twelve slash fourteen dash one T dash ninety three dash one on the west relief side of Sunderland Road, approximately three hundred and seventy five feet southerly of Coles Coles Road in accordance with field plan number A number six A two two zero four nine four submitted upon petition said poll necessary to provide new electric service for number one three eight Sunderland Road Amherst Survival Center. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. And Ms. Idelson, by the way, we uh, did approve the parking for the Trash to Treasures event also yes. earlier this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, okay. Mr. Chuck, for coming in. Thank you. Okay. We have several more minutes until we can get to our 7 o'clock item. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, we have seven minutes, which is a long time. Are we appointed? That's not going to take long enough. Let's start with the annual town election and annual town meeting dates and see where we get to with that. Um, in your packets, you have a calendar from Ms. Roussel, and it identifies the uh, various weeks in April, May, and June for which we need to consider to set dates for both the annual town election and the uh, annual town meeting next spring. Let me pull up my appropriate document here. Um, and typically we hold the annual town election either the last Tuesday of March or the first Tuesday of October. Uh, October. Now I'm <laughs> just talking right April, time here. April. <laughs> making stuff. I remember yes, that. I'm making April. April. Uh, April. So <laughs> either the last Tuesday of March or the first Tuesday of April. This year, those are both rather inconvenient dates. Um, and we need four weeks between the scheduling of the annual town election to the scheduling of the annual town meeting. So I did an informal survey, uh, and I should say that the, the uh, March 26th is the first day of Passover, and the following Tuesday, April 2nd, is the last day of Passover, or it ends at uh, sundown the night before, depending on, on how you observe that holiday. So I did a very unscientific survey of seven Jewish people from across the spectrum of, of all kinds of um, degrees of, of observancy. And I got six responses. And all different. <laughs> all different. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they kind of came down on, on two sides, one of them being that um, that the most, it, it's only the most orthodox folks and, and the smallest number of Jewish people who would still be observing the holiday on Tuesday the 2nd. Um, but then other folks saying, you know what, it's a holiday week all before that. If you can put it off, it's best to put it off. And I'll say that the comment that I found um, most compelling, and, and people did a wonderful job trying to educate me about the different ways that, that Jewish holidays are, are marked and observed, so I'm becoming an expert on Passover, which is fun. Um, uh, one person uh, in their reply to me uh, noted that the state primary is being held this year on Thursday of next week, as opposed to Tuesday, the day right after Labor Day holiday and that they put clearly a lot of time into thinking about how you do things like that too. So just the idea that it really isn't kind of business as usual the day before election day. Um, all signs point to, to recommending that we hold the annual town election on April 9th. So this is for select board consideration. That would have annual town meetings starting on May 6th, um, which is a little bit later than we like to start town meeting, but you know every year is a little bit different, so we're rolling with it. Okay, wait a sec, because this is different than right. So was. my recommendation is coming in late as compared to the calendar. Okay, so the election, um, annual election, would be April 9th, and then the first day of town meeting would be April uh, May sixth. May sixth. <coughs> thoughts to the contrary or otherwise. Well, that was easy. Somebody want to make the motion? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Bird, did you have a comment? Uh, just saying, I mean, we only lose 
quote unquote two days of town meeting that way at the beginning and we certainly have plenty of options for making that later so it just does not feel like a big deal at all it is just later than usual it'll be one of those years that we'll say yes one year out of all the many years we right. didn't do it the last week of march or first week of april that's just how it is and it's funny that that comes right after this falls town meeting which is starting so late for a variety of uh, of holiday and other reasons also oh and Amherst Media, the mic volume and speaker volume is really excellent right now, so thank you. Um, okay, so are we good with that, Mr. Hayden? It's actually been a long time since we've needed 14 sessions to get through town meetings, so <laughs> I, I <laughs> think losing two, now. making it 11 is probably okay. Yeah, I think we'll be safe. All right. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I would. I was just cleaning it up to make sure I make it right. <laughs> I move that the select board schedule the 2013 annual town election for Tuesday, May 9th, with polls open. Am I wrong? April 9th. April 9th. Sorry. April 9th. With <laughs> of course it is. Um, with polls open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and the annual town meeting for May 6th, with additional sessions reserved for May 8th, May 13th, May 15th, May 20th, May 22nd, May 29th, June 3rd, June 10th, <coughs> June 17th, and June 19th, 2012. Second. Further discussion? Ms. Trainey. I just want to point out that that does change the schedule for the when petition articles have to come in and everything else happens, so we should let the TMCC know. So uh, once there's a once there's a calendar um, for these, we, we we like to set these dates nice and early so people can plan ahead and yeah. uh, and within a few weeks. This is next year we're talking about. I understand. Right, yeah. there will be a calendar for this and uh, and they will certainly be notified. Um, and part of our scheduling of all of these things is to always make sure that we have four weeks from the uh, for the signing of the warrant. Right. Anyway, I'll right. figure that out. Uh, to make sure that we accommodate all the TMCC activities. So now our April gets very busy. Yes, indeed. Ms. Brewer. I would actually um, consider not just, you know, as, as the little mechanics that all go on behind the scenes between TMCC and, more importantly, the, the Select Board Town Manager's Office, is that everybody not just say, oh, well, it's later than usual. Let's <laughs> have everything be later than usual. It's more like, let's take advantage of what time we've got, and it might throw TMCC's, you know, precinct meetings off a little bit or that sort of thing. But let's, we don't have to make our deadlines the exact same amount of time. We can still make them longer, you know, if we want to, just for consistency's sake. So I would suggest that, you know, for staff to take upon themselves what makes sense to them and not feel obligated that they somehow have to, you know, it's 27 and a half days or something because the date has changed. Make their lives easier when possible. Good point. All right, did we vote on this? No, we haven't. Not yet. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <coughs> Excellent, those dates are set. And now it is 7 o'clock, so we are all set. 7.01 for our 7 o'clock item. Is Mr. Zomek coming into this or are you speaking to this? I'm speaking to this. Okay, Mr. Musanti then, tell us about the Olympia Oaks HAP land development. Sure. This is a, an amendment to the already approved land development agreement that the select board approved for uh, between the town and HAP uh, Incorporated, the affordable housing developer of the Olympia Oaks uh, project. Um, the request before you is to make one amendment to that uh, agreement that extends the deadline uh, that was in the agreement from November of 2010 uh, that said the, the various conditions needed to be satisfied by November 11th, 2012. The request is to extend that deadline from November 11th, 2012 to June 30th, 2013. Uh, the extension will enable HAP to complete its uh, work to obtain financing for the project and allow more time for them to finish up the other conditions. They're on a, a, a steady pace to do such that, and this will help help them uh, take this project to a successful conclusion. I recommend the board approve it. Thank you. <coughs> Questions or comments for Mr. Musanti? Mr. Hayden. Just one, w <coughs> when I saw this, I immediately <coughs> had that reaction and wondering if we should be concerned. I, it sounds like not. It sounds like this is just the kind of 
delays that are inevitable when you're trying to uh, land grants and you're trying to land certain permits for things. I, th I think that's exactly right. Okay. Anyone else like to comment <coughs> on the HAP situation? All right. No other questions or comments from select board? Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? I move that the select board approve the extension of the deadline by which the conditions of the land <coughs> development agreement between the town of Amherst and HAP Incorporated must be satisfied from November 11th, 2012 to June 30th, 2013. Second. Discussion, <coughs> Mr. Hayden. Do we have to stay after and sign this? We got all kinds of things to sign okay. tonight. <laughs> all right. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Okay. Thank you. A uh, couple more minutes before our 705 item. Now we could do committee appointments. Okay. <coughs> I move that the select board appoint Veronica Wagner to the Agricultural <coughs> Commission, Emily Jung and Liam Brodegon to the Human Rights Commission and Olivia and Victoria Ferra Ferbonio <coughs> and Maria Santiago to the La Paz Centro Nicaragua Sister City Committee, all with terms to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. <coughs> Further discussion? Ms. Brewer. I'm not sure how many names we quite mispronounced there, which is no offense to Ms. Stein, because I do it all the time. But um, Liam Brodigan is a teenager I'm familiar with. So Liam Brodigan, and uh, there are actually three teen teenagers on this list, which makes me very happy to see, yes. because I get them now, nice. while they're still young and enthusiastic. So. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. I, I want to uh, say again, as I did last time, to, to offer my appreciation for these folks to step up and <coughs> do the work which is so important. Thank you very much. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. On? Oh, we have more. I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. <coughs> I move that the select board reappoint Vincent O'Connor to the Nyeri Sister City Committee with a term to expire June 30th, 2015. <coughs> Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. One more. I move that the select board confirm the town manager's <coughs> appointment of Julie Marcus to the Board of Health with a term to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. All right. Now it's time for our 705 item, and this is budget matters, and we have Finance Director Sandy Pooler, Comptroller Sonia Aldrich, and Treasurer Collector Claire McGinnis here to talk to us about the various items here. First up, we have the uh, fourth quarter year end budget update. And uh, again, all of these materials are in our <coughs> packets and available on the Select Board's uh, web packet online for folks following along at home. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> and I'm glad you noted uh, Sonia and Claire's presence because. They really, and their staff are the people throughout the year who do the work to collect this revenue, to monitor the expenditures, um, and to uh, make sure the numbers come out right. Um, so I just want to acknowledge, as we always do, because they always do a good job, what an excellent job they've done for the town. Um, so we have the end of the year report. Uh, we have revenues and expenditures for <coughs> general fund and all the enterprise funds. Um, and the big picture uh, really is this year, uh, in the general fund, we have a total surplus from unexpended funds or revenue that comes in o over and above um, our estimates of about a million dollars. That number is consistent with the same uh, number and percentage of budget that we've had um, at least <coughs> five or six years at least going back. Um, the composition of those numbers are a little different this <coughs> year. Uh, the revenue side is much higher and the turn backs from uh, unextended uh, budgets is much smaller. Um, and we'll get into some of the detail there. But uh, I think if there's any one takeaway from the beginning is that the operations in FY12 has been consistent with um, how we've run the town in the past, 
Um, we've had tight budgeting <coughs> in terms of uh, allocating enough money for departments to operate, but not with a heck of a lot of surplus. You might call it rubbing nickels together <laughs> to make sure things happen. Uh, and then on the revenue side, we have a couple of things that uh, were uh, favorable for us. Some of them I'd call one time, and some of them were a little bit unusual. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn first <coughs> to page four. This is a summary of um, our budget uh, in the general fund. And I wanted to point out two things here. Uh, usually when you see this report, you would see uh, three columns here, budget, actual, and this thing called variance favorable. Um, and we've presented the numbers in that third column, variance favorable or unfavorable, the same way we've presented them every year. But there are two numbers in there that are quite unusual this year and sort of throw off uh, the numbers. <coughs> and so we've adjusted those in the final column to the right uh, to reflect the fact that within general government expenditures, um, you can see that there's a turn back of $495,000 most of that is from the money that was voted at fall, uh, excuse me, at spring town meeting, annual town meeting, to meet the cost of the October snowstorm uh, in case our FEMA reimbursement didn't come to us on time. And we made an appropriation of $426,026 to cover the October snowstorm expenses. Eventually, we got notification uh, th from FEMA and from the Department of Revenue about how to deal with that FEMA notification that we didn't need that appropriation. But that happened after town meeting. So there's a huge turn back of free cash in that number. Um, you don't usually <coughs> see that here, um, and it sort of th throws things off. The other number at the very bottom of there is called transfers out capital. And that's the money that was appropriated for the Puffer's Pond um, project. It was explicitly made contingent at uh, last fall town meeting upon the town getting the a park grant. Um, although we did get a park grant for the pool, we didn't get one for Puffer's Pond. And so that um, reverted back <coughs> uh, and is becoming part of free cash again. Again, a somewhat unusual situation. Um, so w without those numbers, it looks like we have a big $1.9 million turn back, but really um, 800,000 of that is, uh, or more than 800,000 of that is from those two singular events. All right, if I haven't confused you enough already, I'll go through the details. Um, turning to the memo then, um, within the general fund, if we look on page two under revenues, um, <coughs> the town collected 101% of its budgeted revenues. Um, there was a um, surplus of $1,024,199. And within this, there are ups and downs. <coughs> there are some places where revenue came in above expectation and some below which I think just goes to show that um, as good as we like to think we are at doing these things, <laughs> in any one year, you know, it's, it's an estimate and it's not a guarantee. And uh, sometimes you're on the high side, sometimes you're on the low side. And I would just note that the numbers that are in this part of the memo are also the numbers that are on page nine. So uh, there are descriptions in the memo here of, of the major elements and then the, the numbers they relate to are the ones that are on page nine for revenue. Um, so there are a couple of areas where revenue uh, fell somewhat short. Uh, the golf course um, didn't bring in all the revenue that we had budgeted. However, I think the good news is that um, they brought in more than they did the previous year and when you take their expenses into consideration, they covered all of their direct costs. So um, overall, I think it was a more positive this year, year this year for the golf course. Um, the next area is uh, LSSC recreation, and uh, that is the revolving fund that we've set up uh, for LSSC, and it runs everything from volleyball programs to, in the past, this past year it included the um, after school programs and the summer camps and so forth and so on. And that always returns a certain amount of money to the general fund to cover administrative costs and central staff costs. 
Um, that brought in return 77% of what we projected for that. Um, and I think, frankly, this is an area that we need to keep looking at and to see if we're setting the right number. And as we go forward for the FY14 budget, um, I'll be making some recommendations to you about what to do with that. <coughs> um, but that, at least for the last few years, has consistently not returned the amount that we expected it to. And so I, I do think it needs to be looked at. Um, the other uh, area where we didn't uh, hit <coughs> our revenue forecast was investment income. We only took in 72% of what we thought. And that's really because um, you'd, you you'd probably know yourselves from your own bank accounts that the amount of interest you can get on a deposit these days is minimal. Uh, the big account where we keep a lot of our money, um, the, it's called the MMDT, MMDT account. It's a money market account that the state holds for cities and towns. Uh, right now, I think the seven-day yield on that is 0.26 or 0.27%. Um, so that's why that's down. And um, again, going forward, I think we are going to need to adjust that number for FY14 and, and um, when we do the recap sheet this year for FY13 and send the numbers into the state, we'll adjust that. Um, the other parts were uh, generally very favorable. Um, fines and forfeitures um, were very strong, $87,000 over expectation. Some of that has to do with the way the court is reimbursing us uh, for some of our overtime, and the police department is talking to them about that. So I don't know that that's going to continue in the future, but it was a good year for us then. Licenses and permits I was very happy with, particularly since um, building permits had been down a little bit, but electrical permits were strong. And, we and that's because there are two big projects at UMass, and we know there are other projects at UMass and other places in the coming year. So I think that um, that should be a strong area for us. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to skip ahead to some of these things. Motor vehicle excise tax was $200,000 over our estimate. Uh, it really does show that with low interest rates, people are starting to buy cars again, and that's reflected there. Um, as I mentioned, there were some one-time events. Um, we, when we sold our bonds last year, we got a premium on those bonds of $82,000. Um, you never know when you sell a bond if that's going to come in, so we don't really budget that, um, but it was a positive result. Um, and we've had very good luck in the last couple of years with our Medicaid reimbursements. These are things that are for most of the kids in the schools, the schools contract uh, with, with an outside agency to submit a lot of paperwork and keep track of their time and so forth for the, for the services they provide. And they've done a good job of doing that, and so we've gotten good reimbursements. Um, I know a lot of people are always interested in what happens with the meal tax and the hotel motel tax. Um, and certainly they have been very good for us. Um, the meals tax, um, we brought in nearly $400,000 from the meals tax. Um, and um, I th it just goes to show that there's a lot of activity in the town's restaurants and they're doi doing well. Uh, the hotel motel tax uh, also brought in almost $240,000. Um, there was a slight, slight surplus over our uh, projection, but we have to keep in mind that the Lord Jeffrey Inn was open for only half a year, so I think that's going to continue to, to look good. Um, other than that, um, the other two significant things I would just point out that property taxes came in um, right on schedule. Our collection for the last fiscal year where we had a full year was 99%, and that's to be, I mean, that's a good number. It's usually 98 or 99. We like 99 a little better. <laughs> um, so um, the collector is doing an excellent job. Um, and uh, in state aid, as you remember, uh, last fall we had a one-time distribution of $665 million in state aid to cities and towns across the state. Uh, that was uh, worth 514000 to the <coughs> town of Amherst. We appropriated 400000 of that into the stabilization fund, and we left the, the rest of it unspent, and that will revert to free cash. Um, on the expenditure side, um, spending was pretty tight. We um, had a total turn back, really, of about $85,000. And um, if you consider that 62580 of that came from unspent reserve fund, uh, Departments were really coming in with very tight budgets, and, and <coughs> there was a lot of work that um, 
I know particularly Sonia has done with departments to help them manage their budget and make sure that they're coming in um, and, and spending right on schedule. Um, so within the general fund, uh, the general government portion of that um, <coughs> returned um, 6,947. I mean, it was, it was really pretty close if, if you take out the reserve fund transfer. Public safety um, was sort of an interesting year this year. Oftentimes the police department turns back more than fire. This year it was the other way around, partly because the fire department had gotten some grants for some equipment and they were able to display some of their general fund revenue. Um, public works um, within that department, again, you will see the detail of that on um, page 10. Various divisions were up, various were down. Uh, at the end of the day, they basically came in um, <coughs> right on target, um, and they returned about $4,000. Um, but I think the important thing there for people who are watching is that um, we actually had extra money in our snow and ice account, notwithstanding a horrific storm in October. The rest of the winter we didn't go so badly. But October, uh, we did spend a lot of money um, in the construction and maintenance area because their expenses there weren't so much plowing but really clean up of all the trees and that's and that's why it is reflected in that part of the um, of the budget um, I think planning and con conservation and inspections uh, those departments win the prize for coming in with the tightest budget they return seven hundred and sixty two dollars um, and um, community services um, came in almost exactly on budget uh, although you have to keep in mind that we did transfer another 37,420 into the Veterans <coughs> Services Department to make sure that they covered all their costs. Uh, again, that money is reimbursed 75% from the state. Um, and the school department, uh, the elementary schools, <coughs> returned $5,891 to the town. That, that would become part of free cash. That's the, all the general fund. For the enterprise funds, um, the water, sewer, and solid waste funds all uh, had operating surpluses, and they are detailed in um, these uh, subsequent pages here. Um, <coughs> we're used to seeing surpluses from water and sewer. Um, that's good. Solid waste even had a surplus of $6,000, so that was very good <laughs> because, as we know, that's been a very tight budget uh, and um, so I was happy with that. Um, the transportation fund did have a deficit, and if you look at um, page eight, <coughs> you'll see two things. Um, one is that there was a revenue deficit of about $80,000. Um, that was offset somewhat by uh, reduced spending. Um, we kept costs down there, um, and there was a surplus there of uh, $42,000. But it meant that overall, fund balance in the um, transportation fund, which is sort of the free cash for transportation, went down by $38,000. And that really, I think, is mostly because, as you know, there have been issues with implementation of the um, central uh, multi-space meters. Um, and so at various times during the year, either we weren't collecting from those <coughs> meters as much as we wanted to, or more particularly, uh, the parking control officers were busy dealing with making sure the meters worked or fixing them. And so they, um, either because they knew the meters weren't working properly, uh, they just wouldn't stop writing tickets to be fair to the public, or they were time <coughs> taken up with some of that. Um, we've had other discussions about that here, and we know that we're working to make sure that doesn't happen again next year. But that's the, uh, the reason for it. Um, there's still sufficient balance in that fund that we can take a hit to it. Um, but that, uh, I think those are the highlights, and I'd certainly, any of us be happy to answer particular questions members have. Thank you very much. This is a magnificent document. I, uh, it, it provides so much information and so clearly, and uh, a ton of work goes into that. It's very appreciated, so thank you both very much. Um, once again, this uh, document is going to be sent <coughs> to town meeting members. Um, this is something we started doing last year because it seems like really the most appropriate thing to do with town meeting is to give them the wrap-up on how all of the appropriations that they had approved for that fiscal year <coughs> uh, how those all totaled out. So that will be going out in the next uh, week or so. Questions or comments from select board? Ms. Stein. Okay, I of course can't find the exact figures, but you'll know what I'm talking about. 
Um, if you take the amount of uh, turnbacks due to the fact that we didn't fund, have to come up with money for the Peppers Pond project and for the other project that you mentioned, uh, the 426,000 um, that we appropriated for FEMA. Okay, and you add that to the million dollars or so surplus, how much does that then put into our um, total reserves? Um, so if you look on page four, <coughs> at the bottom of the page there, you will see that um, we are, our free cash, all other things being equal, should go up by about $1.9 million. Now I'm going to um, qualify that statement by saying that the way that the comptroller does these numbers, which is on a budget to actual basis, is different than the way the state calculates free cash. There are other factors that they put in, so it's never exactly the same number. So I don't want to give you the impression that free cash is going up okay. by that amount, but that's what's going to be returned. Right. I, I guess what I'm really asking is, so if you take free cash and our stabilization, what's our total reserves at this point? Oh. Is that a fair question? That's a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> um, stabilization fund has about $1.8 million in it. Yep. Um, free cash, I think there is something about around $4 million left in it unspent. Do you remember? Um, that's my recollection from having okay. looked at this the other day. So, so and so and then it <coughs> should will um, so it should go up mm -hmm. uh, from that figure by about two million dollars if you take this uh, these numbers into consideration. So it'd be two plus four. Two plus four plus Billion? the two that's in the stabilization fund. You asked about what our total reserves for I confiscated. So would that be eight? Yeah. The reason I'm asking is that there's some percentage. Um, we were aiming for like 15% of our annual budget, I think. Yeah, the, the idea is sub to be somewhere between five and 15%. That's the exactly. policy. Exactly, exactly. So w this should make us much better than we were because we were down at sort of the 5% closer to 5%? For the last uh, two, three or four years, that was, and uh, this is in <coughs> uh, the budget report and, and, there's, and when we do the um, financial indicators, you'll see these numbers too. But, um, so for several years, we drew down our reserves. Right. And that stopped about four or five years ago. Right. They've slowly been going up. Right. Where um, we're not at the 15% target yet. I don't know yet what number we're going to okay. be at, but All right. we're kind of on the way back up. You don't have to know tonight, but sometime I'd like a, an idea of where we stand on that 5 to 15 percent range. Oh, we will definitely report that, and, and okay. we will report it once we know what our free cash figure is, because it's exactly. based on, on okay. a certified number from the state. Thank you. That's The rest of this is very clear, I think. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, very briefly, uh, I know last July 1, our reserves were approximately seven and a half percent of revenue. Thank you. So, you know, this net of a million nine to the good that yes. Sandy's reporting, you know, eight hundred thousand of that is was a temporary drawdown from our reserves. So part of that is a wash, but we're still looking at a net additional gain to our reserves. And I think it's part of a picture that we've ended this past fiscal year uh, within budget with a small surplus again. Uh, it was a more stable year than we've had in the last couple, uh, but we're still, you know, not out of the woods, and there's still more work and, and you know, caution ahead, but we're in going on the right path. I would also just echo uh, Sandy's uh, kudos to the entire staff. It really is a team effort from staff, uh, uh, Sonia and, and uh, Claire, but also at the... Uh, individual staff members in each each of those uh, departments to keep us on budget and report to us timely and accurately. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. Um, agreed to all those things, and I realize we're running short on time, so I'll try and talk fast. Um, 
these are mostly for the town manager, not so much for you guys, because your report's beautiful, as always. Um, it's, it's more characterizations of things. Something um, for a future report from the town manager, I think would be useful is, um, with the LSSC Recreation Revolving Fund, is to get a sense of not only what are we looking at adjusting it to, just so that we're more accurate, but what we're attempting to accomplish because I know that I have not been to the last several LSSC commission meetings but it's never been clear to me what role the commission might play in this discussion and beyond their being frustrated that they 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 have expressed their frustration that they're expected to pay for more of their lives than other departments necessarily might be or that other recreation departments might be across the state so I know that frustration exists but I'm not sure how they can channel that energy into a positive associated with this and maybe there's a way that can work together um, I appreciated the comments about the Medicaid reimbursement associated with schools as a former school committee member I'm not sure about the trade-off in terms of the amount of paperwork that you have to do in order to get that money but it's the taxpayers money we can't make a business decision like you might if you were running a small business and say that's not worth my effort when it's the taxpayers money I feel like we really do have to go after it even if it does seem like a huge cumbrance so thank you for acknowledging that I think that's important um, I know some towns who haven't done it just because it just doesn't seem worth their while and I think it's the right choice in terms of veteran services I know about the reimbursement and everything I'm just saying I'm just wondering if you can let us know if given what we know now given that we had to make that transfer if FY 13 is relatively on track or if we need to bump it at some point so obviously that'll come up as we continue through the year and just one other thing I think and that is if you could plan in a future town manager report to briefly characterize um, under expenditures on page three where it says general government over expenditures were legal and employee benefits obviously we can't get into a lot of detail here but just to be able to give people a general sense of what that is so that they're less likely to make up their own suppositions as to what that is I think that would be useful um, at some future at some future meeting and speaking of the future of course this is all wonderful and when people say why do you have all that extra money um, again it's not all that extra money and of course we do have this is where you're supposed to give the OPEB speech again about how we need to be funding that <laughs> so uh, you know it's kind of like this constant little tacked on thing to all of our good news because it is really good news but yet it is something that's out there that we need we need to remind everybody is why we're not doing all these marvelous other things we might think to do is because we know we have that those are all excellent points that uh, duly noted and um, the next logical kind of check-in is right around the corner yep. at the uh, four boards meeting in the second week of October where we'll have our you know current year results any current year issues I mean prior year results current year issues including the ones you just mentioned and then preliminary preliminary thinking about budget planning for FY 14 and beyond and also an update on things like reserve set, uh, levels uh, Diana's question thank you Can I, I just add one other thing I know that one point in the past w when we started this great idea of sending this to town meeting members they were kind of confused by what they were getting so you'll make that be less confusing there was a you're mailing magic that way there was a mailing issue last year because okay. of multiple things that ended up yeah. in the same packet and they weren't that's what it well, was yeah we're now it all comes back to me yes yep. thank you <coughs> okay other questions or comments all right uh, again tremendous report great detail and much appreciated so thank, thank you, you both very much all right so next up we have something we've never dealt with before approval of use of funds as an alternative to short-term borrowing welcome um, so this is an alternative that um, I don't think we've used before which is nice to find out there's an easier and simpler way to do something the DOR makes this available to towns they can use their own cash on hand to advance and get started on projects that are approved to be funded by debt it allows us to use a more predictable bonding schedule if we plan it for March we can stick to that and use it in March it also allows us um, some more flexibility in terms of costs as you just heard the story um, from Sandy on interest earnings that also in some ways works in our favor when we go to the market to borrow but it's never as low it always costs more to borrow than what you can earn with your cash on hand um, 
the fixed costs of doing a borrowing become the most important factor. And the, the fixed costs or closing costs, if you will, um, in this case, just make it much easier and much more affordable for us to use our own funds to get these projects going. Um, so I have four forms. I understand maybe the originals wound up in your packet. If not, I have a backup. Okay. <laughs> You've got them. But we do have the uh, we do have the information in our packets about okay. the. So John has the. I have the forms sign for here. signature here too. Okay, great. S uh, and any other questions before I just sort of. Um, I guess I would ask. So the that money is coming from where? Is this a an advance of uh, of the reserves, similar to what we were just talking about, or uh, analogous so to what we did with Puffer's Pond or whatever, but without town meeting approval needed? So it's just the accumulated cash that we have on hand at any one time. When people pay their taxes, we put the money in the bank. We can draw down on that money. Um, and uh, as long as we uh, basically put it back by borrowing in, in March, we can borrow from ourselves. So it's, it's just your operating cash on hand. Okay. Other questions before they get into the specifics of the project? Um, go right ahead. Tell us about these. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. motion. Uh, no, she's going to explain oh. the different um, oh. the different borrow uh, the different things we're going to pay for here. Okay. Oh, okay. So um, there are there were four projects approved in um, to be funded by debt in annual town meeting as part of the capital plan. Uh, trees and equipment related to trees was six hundred and twelve thousand dollars. A large truck for the DPW at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Repairs to the central fire station at $184,000 and communications equipment for the dispatch center and Amherst Police Department at $125,000. In sum, that's a million seventy-one thousand, <coughs> which is, uh, fits very comfortably when I look at our cash flow between now and March when we'll go to uh, the bond market. In March, we will fund um, the balance of the sewer extensions, which were approved a year ago but haven't really started yet other than a design phase, as well as these four together. We'll, all go, we'll go to the bond racket in March for all of that. So otherwise, you would have done a, a, a ban, uh, so called, borrowing anticipation note at this point it, to take us to March. Right, right. But um, the project managers involved just want to get started. They don't want to wait around for um, Great. the treasurer to get that done as well as um, the costs, like we've already said, make this, just make this more advantageous to us. Do you have any sense of how much money that saves? No, no. but closing costs would easily be five to $6,000. That's great, oh, terrific. Okay, other questions or comments? Ms. Stein, make the motion. I move that the select board approve the advance of funds totaling one million seventy one thousand in lieu of borrowing as presented by treasurer slash collector Claire McGinnis in her memo of August twenty fourth, two thousand twelve, for the purpose of funding capital projects including police department communications equipment, repairs to central fire station, large DPW truck, and trees and tree equipment having previously authorized debt for these purposes at annual town meeting, Article 18, on May 16, 2012. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. An exciting new funding opportunity. <laughs> That's yes. great. Saving money everywhere. All right. Thank you for, uh, for all of that good budget information. Much appreciated for all the work that went into presenting it to us and for coming in tonight. All right, 737. So our 730 item then is a public hearing to consider changes to enforcement times in Boltwood parking garage. And this is uh, per our uh, general laws of the town. This was a publicly noticed hearing. And this hearing is called to order at 737 p.m. 
a couple weeks ago or whenever we last met, we talked about the fact that it had been determined that there was a discrepancy in what was going on as far as signage and uh, expected policy in the Boltwood parking garage. That previous policy had been, as far as anyone knew, that uh, enforcement there was seven days a week, but uh, at some point and most likely uh, coincident with the new parking machine installation, the signage on those machines and, in fact, the enforcement policy changed to be six days a week. Um, we talked about needing to, uh, to deal with this discrepancy and that the, uh, as they had been going on in this way for four months and uh, practically a year, to make the policy consistent with the facts on the ground seemed to be the most logical thing to do. So we have recommendations here from the town manager that he will speak to uh, on behalf of the bids parking committee, uh, parking and traffic subcommittee. Um, and also at that meeting, when we talked about the fact that we'd be doing this tonight, we talked about, Ms. Brewer suggested that we also consider standardizing the parking enforcement times in the garage and other areas to end at six o'clock, like with the street meters. Um, so more research and, and information has been done on all of this. There has been uh, consideration by the bid. We have a truly excellent history of parking changes in yes. our packet. It's amazing. This has never been no. <laughs> collected before. Uh, so to have in one place instead of our all having to search through every possible set of minutes that anybody could come up with going back to time in memoriam about when parking changes were made for what, uh, we now have a really good document with that that Ms. Roussel is actually going to try to turn into parking regulation awesome. information with full history. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Mr. Musanti for recommendations. Sure, and I want to acknowledge uh, the excellent work by staff, uh, uh, Sandy Pooler, Claire McGinnis, and also Guilford Mooring and his staff from DPW uh, in uh, researching this and looking at other uh, data analysis and other operational details. Um, so I'm, I'm here to make a recommendation to you in my role as town manager, but also uh, uh, acknowledging uh, the Amherst Business Improvement District. I'm pleased to serve on their board of directors and I'm uh, chairing now the, a parking and transportation subcommittee and we had an excellent discussion a couple of discussions with them uh, most recently on August 17th. So I have the benefit of their uh, input and feedback in developing this recommendation. Bottom line on my recommendation for tonight is I'm recommending that the board um, um, eliminate the 50 cents per hour parking charge at the Boltwood garage on Sundays. And this is so that all public on street and parking lot spaces are free for visitors to our downtown on Sundays. Parking rates will be in effect uh, Monday through Saturday. That makes uh, the parking rules consistent, which is another objective uh, that's been uh, uh, um, strongly suggested by uh, uh, the Business improv Improvement District uh, folks, um, and that would get us there. In my uh, uh, package to you on the cover memo, uh, uh, for I'm recommending that. We think the, uh, the revenue loss to the town is minimal on Sundays. It's somewhere around $7,500 in the most recent year. And in the grand scheme of our parking system and all the ins and outs, uh, that small loss of revenue uh, we think is uh, much less important than the overall good uh, that will be ma made by, by having that uh, enforcement and parking charge on Sunday be consistently zero. Um, so that's the recommendation. Uh, the uh, bid parking and transportation uh, committee, uh, we had a very good uh, uh, wide ranging discussion about parking issues. And I've tried to summarize those in my cover memo to you. Uh, and there are a number of them that were flagged for uh, future consideration, the nature of these are that um, um, some are more complicated than others, some have more uh, budgetary and revenue implications than others, and they, re they require some further exploration before I'm in a position to offer you a, a recommendation, but you can count on those, uh, you know, in the months ahead. 
uh, you know, for future consideration. Those issues are, for example, the issue uh, that Ms. Brewer raised at uh, one of your recent meetings about uh, the fact that we charge for parking in the parking lots between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. and the street meter fee ends at 6 p.m. Uh, looking at whether having those uh, end times be uh, more consistent uh, than they are presently. And there's a lot of uh, revenue as well as policy, policy and behavior modification <laughs> uh, issues at work there that will influence that discussion. But that's been flagged for something we, as something we want to look at. Um, we've also, uh, in the bid, uh, expressed, uh, again, in this theme of consistency in our rules. Um, does it make sense, for example, to have our enforcement or parking charge hours be the same for all public parking, not just not one set of rules for the lots and another set of rules for the parking meters. So there's, again, budgetary and policy considerations to be explored more in depth uh, related to that. Uh, there's some interest, uh, and I have an interest as well in, in exploring what has proven to be uh, popular uh, over in Northampton at the uh, Thorns Market Garage, where there's a first hour free policy, and does, does that sort of policy or some variation of it make any sense uh, for the town of Am Amherst. And uh, I want to explore that with staff and with the bid. Uh, there was an expression that uh, the six 15-minute uh, short-term spaces serving the downtown that have been uh, instituted in the last couple of years have proven to be quite popular. And the notion that we should explore creating additional such spaces. Um, um, the bid is also very much interested uh, in creation of uh, what, what they would call a campus shuttle, increasing the frequency uh, and visibility of a shuttle service from the downtown area uh, to the university campus as well as the uh, uh, other two college campuses to encourage uh, more uh, students and faculty and staff from the colleges to um, you know, take, take advantage of all the wonderful thing and opportunities available in our downtown. And then uh, longer term, uh, looking at things like uh, creating additional public restrooms, which has come up in focus groups going back a couple of years now at least uh, in the uh, uh, development of the bid proposal itself. So that's been raised. So I want to flag those for you and for the wider community as policy issues and uh, needs uh, in our downtown that are worthy of further study. Okay, so I'm going to go to uh, select board questions first and then we'll open it up for public comment. <laughs> Ms. Brewer. Um, I appreciate you mentioning, for example, that restrooms have been on the burner for years now. I would just um, like to make sure we're clear that at the bottom of page one of this memo, it says that with the assistance of the bid parking and transportation committee, which is wonderful, um, these things were all identified before speaking with them. These were things that were not identified talking with them. They were identified as being continuing discussion items with them. They were talked about before informally, a parking commission informal discussions for a long time now. While I um, truly appreciate not working in a vacuum, I am also frustrated by the length of time it's taking us to consider some of these issues because while restrooms is a pretty big deal, um, we've been talking about hours six to eight and the other things off and on for many years now and it's obviously you know a matter of what are we trying to accomplish and that's what we see as we look through these regulations you know is it till 11 at night or 9 at night or you know is it, is it keeping more students from parking here or is it like encouraging people to stay longer for dinner you know what are what are we really trying to accomplish and so I think that the bid um, work is incredibly important now and, and serves an even better purpose than the previous connection you had with the chamber associated with the parking commission so I, I see only positives coming out of that except it's moving a little slow to suit me um, I am concerned about trying to change anything in terms of timing, and so I feel like by saying, well, we could wait on this a little bit longer, we're going to have to wait another year, because if we don't do it at the beginning of a school year, it feels really awkward to try and change something. So, you know, does it matter that much? No, not really. But it, it, is, it is worth, I think, considering then, if we're not ready to do anything other than the Sunday now, 
to make a commitment that we will be ready to make some sort of decision which will involve another hearing. Um, I assume, if particularly if we're talking about taking in you know, $20,000 a year in less revenue, or on the other hand, perhaps enforcing all the parking up until 8 p.m. Um, I hope we would consider making a commitment to looking at this by the time of next school year so that we'd be, we'd be set for September so that people were not surprised in October or December or February or whenever else we might decide to choose to do this. Um, one of the uh, two points I just want to make further about that is one is that it just feels wrong that I can get out of my car at a meter and I don't have to pay after 6 o'clock, but I have to walk to some machine that I may or may not be able to figure out to 8 o'clock. It's just, it just doesn't set well with the public, and so I just really like to see us. It's just that confusion factor that is very frustrating to me. I'm not sure if the whole answer is 6 or if the answer is 8 for everything, but I think there probably is an answer that's more for everything associated with that simply so that people don't feel that awkwardness. The other question I think that um, I'm hoping will come out, and I don't know how you tease this out because it isn't a discussion we've had before, is what enforcement costs look like in terms of people walking around? Because that's certainly always a concern. You know, what are people doing out there? Are they giving me a ticket one second after my thing expired? But it's also, if there's no parking enforcement anywhere in town on Sunday, does anybody work parking enforcement on Sunday? Or if they do, what are they doing? Are they looking for handicapped things? And so the same thing, you know, after six o'clock, after eight o'clock, I think it would give people in the community, as well as myself, a better understanding of how we best deploy those resources. Because I know we don't have a lot of parking people, but when we do have them, how are we using them effectively so that, you know, we aren't, we aren't setting ourselves up to make our, an enforcement issue that's actually costing us more to have a body out there to enforce it than we're bringing in and the goodwill that it's costing us. So I know that you're considering all those things in your mind, but if you could tease them out on some of the paper as we move forward with this, okay. I think that would really be helpful. Thank you, Ms. Stein. Um, I have some concerns about the first hour being free in terms of the hit that our parking revenue would take. Um, another thought is that people's frustration very often is because a particular meter or place where you pay, it's not very clear what the limit, uh, you know, from does it end at six, does it end at eight? If it would just could be more clearly marked, particularly in some of the meters where you can't read it very well. And the last thing about the shuttle idea, which I like a lot, if it were something cute and red and trolley-like, it might attract more students to be uh, eager to come downtown to ride that kind of vehicle. So just my thought. Thank you. Questions or comments from Select Board, Mr. Hayden? I'm going to start with the, the trolley idea. That, that's, um, that's fabulous. Uh, other committees that I'm part of, um, I know that that would resolve some of the issues that, that we have heard expressed there as far as sort of moving the traffic where it's most um, advantageously moved from point A to point B. Um, I also want to comment on an unexpected benefit from these parking meters. I, I'm, rec I'm remembering the parking study about six years ago, and there's a lot of sort of generalization about, you know, how parking is utilized and when and where, and there were some kind of contradictory um, revelations that it, that it had. Um, I'm looking at this auto tracks thing here, yeah. and um, this is marvelous. Um, it's a little bit misleading. There are a lot of spots that show people parking at a meter less than an hour a day on average, which doesn't surprise me because there's been a dumpster there for um, a year in one place. In the other place, the pavement is all torn up and missing, as Mr. Alsasser mentioned earlier. But other than that, there's some red spots, which are very interesting to note. And um, I think that when we been, begin to move everything onto the system, which I imagine we will, that um, we'll have a much um, a better tool for managing this, which is kind of a, an important function of, of the municipality and now the BID downtown to get this parking arranged. Um, that's other stuff, it's all been said, so thank you. 
Yeah. Questions, Mr. Well, S since we're all doing this, like, why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, thank, so I want to thank Ms. Brewer for raising those issues just as, as context, because some of those things we took up, as she knows, in the master plan too, like the question of public restrooms. You know, it's hard to attract people downtown to public events if they don't have restrooms because they can't be going to private establishments and so forth. So it's all sorts of combinations of revenue and welcoming atmosphere and so forth. And, and Mr. Hayden's point about parking too. The other one I want to mention, even though it's just a little bit off topic, is that much as we want to increase parking revenue, uh, increasing parking efficiency is important because of the last studies uh, I recall showed we had enough parking and it wasn't used the right way. But then this larger problem of not encouraging uh, excessive vehicular traffic. So if we could have a shuttle system with parking that got people not driving around all over downtown, that would be the ideal. That's a bigger picture kind of thing, but just to, to flag that interest in reducing the personal auto. Okay. So the recommendation in front of us then is to deal with the Sunday issue, make that retroactively official, that there's no enforcement on Sunday and everything else, the recommendation is to table that and wait for further study and recommendation by the bid. Members of the public like to speak to these issues. Mr. Kelly, please come forward and identify yourself with the mic. Uh, Larry Kelly, South Pleasant Street. I could be the poster boy for what Alyssa was talking about because I received the ticket uh, the night, uh, Friday night of the uh, Taste of Amherst, and it was a gorgeous day, actually ni a little nicer than today, as a matter of fact, and I told my wife, she was at working out at Hampshire Athletic Club, and I said, well, I'll meet you at uh, six o'clock at the Taste, and I had my five-year-old with me, so I got up to the center of town at like five of six, and I looked in the front parking lot, being the eternal optimist that I am, in front of town hall, and of course that was packed, and then being an ARA member, I knew about the uh, secret one behind t uh, town hall. So I went back there and sure enough, there were some parking spaces. And, but when I was in front of town hall, I specifically looked at the huge signs near the little machines and the huge signs said it parking enforcement till 6 p.m. And I was like, wow, it's only five of six. And I got back there and it was maybe three minutes of six. And I figured, wow, it's a gorgeous Friday night. He'll cut me three minutes worth of slack. So. I wandered off. Sure enough, I get back a couple hours later and I have a ticket and I was like, I can't believe it. And I looked at the ticket and it was dated, it was time stamped 606. And that's when I got really confused. And at that point, I actually walked over to the little tiny machine and it did say on the tiny machine enforcement till 8 p.m. But I don't think anybody else would do that. So, I mean, I, I fought the ticket. I knew the town would give me a fair shake and Claire nixed the ticket. But I'm, uh, my concern would be what about somebody who, you know, Joe Plummer who's coming to Amherst for the very first time from Westfield or Springfield or some other surrounding community. And that, you know, and the taste of Amherst tends to attract people from all over, all over the area. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not beyond the realm to consider some of those people could be first timers. And that's your first experience. You get a ticket. And then you say, that's it, I'm never coming back to Amherst. And that's what you can't really calculate is, you know, what is that impact on the Amherst cinema or on all of our restaurants? So I think it's a, a good idea to A, keep it to six o'clock. I think seven, eight o'clock is way too late. Um, and also obviously to standardize it and keep all of them at six o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, other public comment? Okay. Um, then I'll take a motion to close the public hearing at 7.55. I so Aye. move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron. All in favor of closing the public hearing at 7.55, say aye. 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 Is that unanimous? Are folks just yes. <laughs> lazy here? Aye. Okay. Aye. Public hearing is closed. Time for select board deliberation. Um, so I will note with appreciation the, the detailed uh, memo and recommendation that we have here and how it reinforces how complicated parking issues are and how you turn one dial and it turns all the other dials. And that's really why it needs to be looked at in the larger context. Um, I agree uh, that the bid is really an, a, a terrific way to be doing that, much stronger way than we've had in recent years to be doing it. Um, because, you know, as to Mr. Kelly's point, to the points others have made, um, the, the stakeholders are the businesses. This is really about managing parking for the for the um, maximum benefit of the businesses and, and all the folks who are using our downtown. So uh, that is a, a great group to be really looking at the pros and cons and the different trade-offs that are all involved here and to be doing the, the legwork and homework on this to bring a recommendation to us. So I am looking forward to the future recommendations on these great uh, issues that have been raised and ap I appreciate the recommendations tonight. Um, any other comment 
on the recommendations as we have it. Okay, so then we are looking to uh, deal with the Sunday issue, uh, and I just have to say, just to quibble, since people are quibbling, I'll quibble, <laughs> that the, uh, the thing about it, it represents a $7,500 loss of revenue. So that's $7,500 of, of people who have accidentally put money in the meters for on Sundays in Boltwood Garage. If we were to keep the policy, then we would actually increase enforcement and we would change the signage. That would be a totally different number. So that's $7,500 of just like, just by accident. Um, I assume that that's true, as opposed to this not being historical information about how much we get on Sundays uh, from Boltwood Garage prior to this changeover to the Saturday. Policy, right? So, which is to say, during this time of confusion, we've gotten seventy-five hundred dollars out of them, but that doesn't actually represent what the revenue would be with a with a different policy. All right, that's the end of my quibbling. <laughs> Anybody else have questions, quibbles, comments, Ms. Burr? And we're sorry we're not giving it back. But <laughs> 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 too late now. Um, yeah, I would. Just, um, I I'm fine with the vote on the thing. I just want to ask that we this be perhaps one of our you know, semi-quarterly or whatever uh, reports on where we are at, just because I do believe the timing issue is important for the beginning of the school year. Okay, um, so I think nobody has more of an interest in getting this done than the bid, so I'm not worried about well, them dilly-dallying with this. I would, uh, I would say that I, I guess I'm not quite so wedded to your idea that it has to start at the end of the year. I think there are all kinds of transitions we could use, you know, whether it was January 1st, voila, okay. new parking, or the beginning of summer or whatever. But um, but if, if we had a great policy already, we would find a way to hook it to, to some new beginning. Possibly. I, I mean, but, it's a, it, but your point is a good one. All right, anything else? Ms. Stein, would like to make a motion. I move that the select board approve the elimination of the 50 cents an hour fee in the Boltwood Garage parking lot on Sundays, effective immediately. Second after <laughs> second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Thank you very much, Ms. Brewer. And I just don't think we can say enough this history of the parking regulations. I mean, magnificent. I've never seen anything come before the select board <laughs> before <laughs> that said what we used to do. So this is amazing. Thank There's you. There's two of them tonight. It's yeah. so good. I said to Mr. Russell this afternoon, uh, I, I had pointed to her a couple of things that I'd found that wasn't nearly as comprehensive as this. I said, the problem is Alyssa is going to say, this is so great, we want everything to look <laughs> like this. <laughs> 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 what would that be? <laughs> the full history of every decision ever made. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, all folks who came in for this and prepared information for us. Much appreciated. All right, it is now 8 o'clock. My God, that was perfect timing. Our 8 o'clock issue is, uh, oh, no, no, seven, no, nope. no, 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 uh, conduct a public hearing process in order to discontinue a Hampshire County way, which is the you know 17th or 18th century way of discontinuing a road. They were originally approved uh, through the county government uh, process uh, eons ago, and there are two such uh, stretches of road in Amherst that are currently county ways uh, that need to be discontinued and they're summarized and along with uh, uh, maps uh, from Mr. Mooring. Uh, the first is the uh, Atkins Corner, uh, former uh, you know, Route 116 north and south by Atkins Market uh, in the vicinity of the new roundabouts. Uh, the old roadbed uh, is officially a county way and needs to be discontinued now that we have the roundabouts. So this is a logical kind of next step uh, in the uh, legal machinations related to uh, completing that road work with the new roundabouts that are in service. So that's one. The second one is along Eastman Lane and it's basically the entire stretch of Eastman Lane from East Pleasant to uh, North Pleasant on the UMass campus. And this uh, the 
the road itself, while it would be the original county way would be discontinued, the basic road layout as you see it would remain as it is. Uh, this would make the uh, uh, would make Eastman Lane, which is within the uh, you know interior of the UMass campus, consistent with all of the other uh, roads in the interior of the UMass campus that they would not be considered county ways and that gives the university uh, the same flexibility in terms of repairs and upgrades along those roads and other uh, uh, related uh, future development um, along the edges of that of those roads um, and so uh, that because it's a county way requires the same same process questions or comments Ms. Brewer Okay, I'm just gonna say this. this doesn't really even make any sense to me because I don't understand what the county really does at this point, but I really don't care, I guess is what it comes down to because it just doesn't make a lot of logical sense to say it's it's fine for them to take this off their Eastman thing so that Eastman Lane off so University can do what they want to do, but it won't change the use of Eastman. It's like, really? I mean, it's just one of those old things we just have to get out of the control of that so that people can just do what they normally do, right? Uh, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. And it's uh, just odd. That's exactly it. And uh, in my ongoing discussions with the university, when we look at road-related issues, this is one of them that's in the, this needs to be cleaned up so list. Uh, housekeeping yes. of ancient history. Okay. And I'll note that this isn't just us being really neurotic about things. This is under uh, Mass General Law, and we have the law uh, in our packets. And mm. the reason that this is a little bit different, if you read through the law, you might say, well, did we need to call this as a public hearing? We don't need to call it as a public hearing because we are not actually doing the discontinuance right. of the road. We are requesting the discontinuance yes. from, the, from the body. Which who the has law the lays out as the process the town to its, you know, Town Council or Select Board makes such a request to the county. And then they'll do the public hearing and a butter notifications butter notes. or whatever to, to, to <coughs> their weird part of this formal technicality of discontinuing the property. Ms. Brewer. Absolutely. And I was just going to ask that the um, when Ms. Stein makes this motion, as I'm sure she will, that she, she referenced the MGL somehow by tacking it on somehow that that's the process we're following in, in her wonderful wordsmithing way. Mr. Hayden. Maybe I'm not quite as sanguine as <laughs> Ms. Brewer's about this. Um, the, uh, the reason the county took these back last century was to um, resolve a number of land disputes that, that came up over property lines. Is the road yours or mine or, you know. And this was, this was the, the, the solution that the state imposed on everybody for untangling that. Um, for the Atkins Corners, I mean, that, that's obvious. I, I'm going to assume, no, I'm going to ask the question whether the road layout, first of all, you promised that this was the last time we were going to look at this stuff was when we did the easements in the town meeting last fall. But any event, um, here we are no looking road. at it again. <laughs> um, so will the layout then be changed to, to follow the easements that we approved in town meeting? Um, you move it away from where it was to where they are now? Is that part of the, the plan, the part of the process? Uh, I believe the answer to that is yes. Okay, and that, that's what I would have, and I think that's what the red line on this, yeah. this drawing means. Um, with Eastman Lane, um, I have a different concern. Um, I, I don't understand how we might lose control of that. That road um, looks like an important safety valve on East Pleasant Street. Um, Many years ago, traffic was redirected down East Pleasant Street, I think by accident, that really oughtn't to be there, away from um, UMass. Um, the current um, traffic plan, and I looked at it so long ago, I really cannot recall it precisely, doesn't move towards resolving that issue. Um, when, and there is such a time when that, that <coughs> begins to be worked on again, Eastman Lane seems like a critical path to relieving that, that that uh, traffic flow, um, are we giving it up? Um, do we give, we just say, okay, UMass, do what you will with it. Now, I love UMass dearly, but um, they do have a different agenda than we do um, over traffic and issues like this. So I just wanna make sure that we don't give away something accidentally. I can assure you from my own direct discussions uh, and also the uh, 
uh, master planning work uh, from the university um, that Eastman Lane uh, will remain open for a very, very long time, if not forever. Uh, part of the master planning uh, in terms of ca uh, traffic flow, et cetera, also included the location of, you know, the UMass uh, Police Department along North Pleasant with ready access to the heart of campus along Eastman Lane. Um, and that's based part on the of bus group routes. Group? Uh, there's a commuter component there. Uh, it's going to remain a, an important connector road. But is that based on UMass's goodwill and their promises, or is that something that is enforceable at our end? Uh, both. Okay. Your turn. And a third question. Um, sort of looking forward, I, I know of several other of these things that are kind of not exactly nailed down in town. Yep. Um, are we going to see those, and are we going to just be a little bit more strict with them? I don't, I don't know. Um, are we going to start, are we starting a trend here? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I do know there's a relative handful of other such streets, and it's uh, in the grand scheme of resolving uh, road-related issues. You know, it's well down the list. But, uh, no, I don't think you're going to see a flood of these requests right. anytime soon. Phew. Thank you. Other questions or comments from select board? Um, so just to see if I'm understanding this correctly, even after I went and talked about the law. Um, so Mr. Hayden's question about Eastman Lane um, made me wonder, whatever happens next. So this talks about the, here's the memo from Mr. Mooring, says the attached motion will allow the COG, Council of Governments, to discontinue the county layout to the town so that the layout, so that the layout can be discontinued to the university. Does that suggest that we are going to have another hearing? The town would then discontinue it to the university or that uh, will all happen through the COGS action? Uh, it happens through the COG action. Okay. So any concerns whether they're, I don't wanna say legitimate, but uh, the, the, the types of concerns that Mr. Hayden raised would ever be considered where or when? Um, that's just through ongoing discussions with the university, or that would be part of the, the COGS consideration? Uh, it'd be ongoing discussions between the town and the I university. Okay. So, Mr. Hayden, are you satisfied that, that, that satisfied. your concerns are sort of addressed by some process going forward? I'm satisfied, but I'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> Good enough. All right, other questions or comments about this? No, we were just discussing the appropriate way to reference this. Would you say Title 14, Chapter 82, Section 32A? Uh, it'd be uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 32, Section 32A. Okay, so skip the title, title 14. Skip the Title 14. Okay, fine. <laughs> just want to make sure I do it right. Any other questions or comments? All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? That's right. I move that the select board, as described under Chapter 82, Section 32A, requests the Hampshire Regional Council of Governments, formerly Hampshire County Commissioners, to discontinue portions of the Hampshire County ways located in Amherst and described as follows. A, West Street, by county layouts established from 1732 through 1964, as shown on sheets one through seven of plans prepared by Foresight Land Services, December 2011, to be recorded in the Hampshire Registry of Deeds, beginning at a line normal to STA 106 plus 00, zero and running northerly to West Bay Road and Bay Road to a line normal to STA 120 plus 59.91 for a total distance of about 1,460 feet. B, West Bay Road by County Layout 1732 and following, formerly known as Bay Road, the Bay Road and other names, from a line normal to STA 403 plus 00, zero easterly into the County Layout of West Street, described above, for a distance of about 300 feet. 
C. Bay Road by said county layouts of 1732 and following from a survey point of STA 500 plus 00 within the above described county layout of West Street Easterly about 200 feet to align normal to STA 502 plus 00 being depicted on plans described above and D, Eastman Lane, an 1883 county layout number 92 running easterly from North Pleasant Street to East Pleasant Street through a width of 33.00 feet for a distance of about 3,200 feet. Second. Uh, did you want to, did you include the I legal the reference? Beginning. Oh, you did at the beginning, okay, sorry. <laughs> Lost it as it went on there. S still as second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, further discussion, Mr. Eden. I, I, somewhere there's a, a surveyor. I think is going to be very pleased to know that his spray painted markings on the road are going to become part of the uh, the permanent record. Those station numbers that you read are are survey marks. Also, uh, I'm I guess I'm glad that someplace um, these things are recorded. 1732 is kind of an interesting moment mm -hmm. in Amherst history when that road was laid out. Um, in 1883 as well. So. Okay. Sad to lose them, but that's the way it goes. Further discussion. 32 is before we became a town, I officially. Mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it's going. Yeah. Hmm? Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That aye. is unanimous. Okay, that's two things we've never done before that we did tonight. That, that uh, borrowing alternative and now discontinuing roads by the county. Okay. Now, we are late for our 8 o'clock item. Is early to celebrate? <laughs> no. Uh, okay, our 8 o'clock uh -huh. item, we have a request from Mr. <coughs> Kelly to reconsider the proposal to, or reconsider the policy for flying commemorative flags on September 11th. And Mr. Kelly, if you'd like to come forward and talk to us about this. And introduce yourself again. For folks uh, Larry Kelly, South Pleasant Street, Amherst, of course. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the board for having this public hearing and whoever the select board member was who requested it to get it on the agenda. I want to thank you as well. Um, about 15, 16 years ago when the Big Y first opened on University Drive, actually before they opened, they came before the select board, the Amherst select board, and they wished to have the town seal uh, embossed in the floor of the Big Y because as some of you know, it's it's in Amherst, but it's also in Hadley. So they wanted to do, yeah, you probably remember this. They wanted to have the town seals indicating here's Hadley, here's Amherst, and here's the line between the two, which is kind of cute. The select board didn't like the idea at all. They turned them down cold, unanimous vote. Um, that select board 15, 16 years ago recognized the, the power of a symbol. That symbol right there, it represents you, it represents me, it represents everyone in this town. Well, that symbol over there, that flag, represents you and me, everyone in this town, but everyone in this country. And on 9-11, we lost 2,997 individuals in a two-hour period, 98% of them civilians, 98%. I mean, the federal government only has the flag nationwide flying at half staff for four occasions, four occasions. Memorial Day, of course, Pearl Harbor, Peace Officers Day, please, and now 9-11, only four days. We have the flags up, the commemorative flags up on six occasions. I hate to use the word holiday because I think that's gotten us into trouble over the last 10, 10 or 11 years because most people consider July 4th to be a holiday, and actually if you interview people, they would think of Memorial Day. Oh yeah, that's a holiday, I don't have to work that day, but it's, it's not. I mean, Memorial Day is we're remembering those who died so that I can come here and invoke my First Amendment right, and you as public officials who are duly elected represent the democratic process that makes this country so great. I mean, that's really what it's all about, is what that, what that flag represents. So. I finally Googled the word commemorative this morning. And I just want to read it to you, the number one return for commemorative. Well, it's commemorate, but variation of commemorative. Commemorate, quote, recall and show respect for someone or something in a ceremony to serve as a memorial to. 
That's what commemorate means. We call these flags commemorative flags. So I, I'm not even sure where this whole idea came up that they're, they're festive. Well, yeah, they're up the 4th of July, and that is a festive occasion. Let's have marching bands and apple pie and fireworks later on that night. Very festive occasion. 9-11, one of the worst moments in American history. F as far from festive as you can possibly get. But again, let me read the word commemorative to you again. The definition, recall and show respect for someone or something in a ceremony. That's what those flags are. They're commemorative flags. And we fly them on Memorial Day. So why aren't we flying them on 9-11? I just I do not understand it. It it's, has nothing to do with commemorative. I mean, I mean, it has everything to do with commemorative. It has nothing to do with festive. So, I mean, 11 years ago, I asked that select board, and we're talking three different select boards here, the one 16 years ago, the one 11 years ago, and you here tonight, but 11 years ago, I asked that select board on September 10th, 2001, 12 hours before the first plane struck, do you really want to be remembered as the politicians who voted against the flag? Well, apparently they did, because they voted, well, actually, I shouldn't say that, they, they voted to let them fly six times. So all I'm asking is to let them fly seven times. And you do let them fly on 9-11, but every five years. So you're saying that it is okay to commemorate 9-11, but only once in five years. Or the pessimist would say, you don't commemorate it four out of five times. So that's my question to you. Do you really want to give the general public the impression that the town considers 9-11 to be commemorable one out of five times, or to not commemorate it four out of five times. And that's a god-awful message to send. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so if I may, I will kind of quickly summarize what got us here. Um, so uh, after the year after 9-11, uh, the f flags did fly at that time, and I believe they did for a couple of years, and at some point that stopped. Um, Mr. Kelly brought a request to town meeting in 2007 to fly the flags every 9-11 every year. And that vote failed two to one. At that time, I voted f in favor of that uh, with the minority, but that vote failed two to one, and uh, many of my colleagues also voted for that. Um, since that time, uh, Mr. Kelly has come back and asked us again to reconsider this policy. In the wake of the vote of 2007, when he came in 2008, Mr. Weiss, then on the select board, suggested a compromise. And the compromise at that time was to fly them uh, once every three years, which was reflective of the town meeting support, one-third in favor, two-thirds opposing. So we did that uh, for a couple of years. Then in 2000 and what was it? 2010, he came back and, and asked again. Um, and at that time, we changed the policy to once every five years. And that way, it would um, make sure to note all of the, um, the milestone years, the 10-year, 15, 20-year anniversaries, et cetera. So at that time, um, at, at when the select board voted on Mr. Weiss's policy, there was that was in the wake of division by town meeting, which is kind of our best representative of the town's general sense. Um, and but a, a, a compromise was proposed uh, despite the fact that town meeting had rejected it, and it was a it was a very thoughtful compromise. Um, at which time uh, there were four select board members at that time because one had resigned. Um, and we supported the compromise, and, and one was absent. It was actually a three, three select board person vote that night. Um, we supported that two in favor of the compromise and one opposed. So now that's two votes by your various elected bodies um, about the flag, none of which was to fly it every year. When we voted on this again in 2010, uh, and in fact I proposed the compromise for every five years that time, um, two of my colleagues uh, felt that they should fly every year, and two of my colleagues felt very strongly that that was not the appropriate way to commemorate 9-11. So 
we have the town meeting, which is our largest representative body, rejecting this entirely by a wide margin. And we have the select board full of people who I have the greatest respect and admiration for who are divided, last we talked, divided on this issue. And so all those things point for me to the same vote that I had in uh, 2010 to a compromise. When the town has indicated through its electric elected representation on multiple occasions now that this is not something that everybody feels uh, the same way you feel about it, uh, that was the appropriate vote. Now granted things change over time so it's not inappropriate to see if people's feelings are different but I just wanted to um, give people a little history about that and also to uh, to reposition what you're saying as the, uh, you know, it's, it's appropriate one year, but it's not appropriate four years. What it is, is a statement of the towns. It's a compromise that reflects the towns, every indication so far of not seeing eye to eye on this issue. So I think it's been very fair and very thoughtful, and it certainly is worth considering again. So, uh, so I, I just want to say that that's where the select board was coming from with its compromise. It doesn't have anything to do with rejecting the flag. It, it can't be characterized in any other way than being a compromise that in our um, best, by our best uh, assessment, represents the, the, uh, the, the different ways that the town feels about this. So, select board members, how do we feel about it this time? Mr. Wald. In general, I guess I see no reason to be against flying the flag of the country we live in. But, you know, that said, also to add to the context, the town does fly the flag of the United States every day in front of town hall. And we also do commemorate September 11th. As Mr. Mizanti reminded us, there's a ceremony, and Mr. Kelly knows, at the fire station every year, and again this year at 955 on September 11th. So both those things are being done. Um, I guess I was thinking about this as, you know, historically, uh, and I'm glad Mr. Kelly mentioned things like Pearl Harbor, because obviously for a certain generation that was the equivalent of this, and people felt very strongly about that. I'm not sure that people of the younger generation identify with Pearl Harbor. It was important. Uh, the small town of North Ad Adams I came across recently in a different context, every year still marks an attack by the French and Indian forces against Fort Massachusetts in 1746. So for them, that's a significant thing to mark. So I guess I would say that, you know, I understand the reasoning on both sides. Uh, I have no reason to oppose flying the flag as an appropriate commemoration. Uh, sensibilities change as to what holidays or what commemorative dates are most important and how we celebrate them, so I'm open to the suggestion. Uh, but we do also, I want to make clear, we do mark both, we mark the date and we fly the flag for those in the audience who may not have that context. Thank you very much. Others? Mr. Hayden. I, I'm, um, I've been trying to collect my thoughts on this for, well, since I knew this was on the agenda. And I, I'm, I, I want to appreciate um, uh, Ms. Roussel's putting together, I assume it was Deborah who put this together, this, this, this history, um, including um, parallel events to what Amherst is all about um, um, and decisions and the discussions that were had, including the ones on uh, the day before. Um, I'm not going to go over the, the discussion that, that I entered into last year, well, last time, um, on appropriate commemorations um, that are missed um, maybe uh, and should be higher on the list than um, I mean, that's a horrible thing. I mean, it was a terrible thing, and it's the most horrible thing that's happened in my lifetime, I grant that, but not the most horrible thing or the most commemorable thing that's happened to the United States of America um, in its history. Um, I'm not going to speak to that. Um, rather, I want to reflect on how much um, I feel I'm charged and my colleagues on the select board are charged with representing um, the most interesting town in Massachusetts. And one of the things that's so interesting about it is that it, it, people come here from all over for all kinds of reasons with all kinds of notions about what is appropriate to celebrate, what is appropriate to um, speak out against. Um, and um, I think that um, I feel, on top of my other personal feelings, that it really does honor their sensibility 
to once again vote no. Um, yeah. Ms. Stein. Um, as one who had family in New York on that day and understanding their feelings, um, and I will also vote no because to them, the appropriate ceremony is what goes on at the firehouse. It would be having the town hall flag at half mast. It is a time of mourning. It was a time of loss. It was a time of fear. And I just, to me, flying the flags um, from each post just doesn't do justice to the depth of the tragedy of that day. So that's my feeling, and I will vote no. Ms. Brewer, would you like to offer any comment? Sure, since my name's <laughs> in here as yeah, 2010, Alyssa said she'd put together the package Deborah just did. Yay, if you wait two years, you can always hope. Um, I gave the speech Ms. O'Keefe gave when there was less history back in 2008. Um, I guess the only thing that, that, that I can add that's different than anything I've said in previous years, for all those in out TV land who haven't heard this over and over, is I come to appreciate over time that the longer I do this, that the less that the way I see things is obviously the way ever the people see them. And so it, while on the one hand I've always thought if this is really important to a number of people to fly them and it doesn't really matter one way or the other to a bunch of other people, then why not fly them? That's a positive. Clearly it does matter to a whole bunch of other people to not fly them. I would argue that town meeting is um, typically, <coughs> in this case, I would, I would suspect the town meeting um, vote in this area was perhaps stronger than it might be on a town-wide vote in terms of the margin that, was, uh, that, was, uh, that occurs in town meeting. But again, town meeting is what we have. We don't do town-wide votes on most things. Um, and I would, the longer I look at, you know, what's commemoration, what's a holiday, What's the purpose of this? I certainly like the idea. It appeals to me from an educational standpoint to say, oh, look, the flags are flying. What does September 11th mean to us? Except we don't need to fly the flags to do that. We need to participate in the National Day of Service. We need to go to the commemoration at the firehouse. We need to look at the half mass flags, in my opinion, and say, oh, kids, this is why we're talking about this. I would argue, without having researched an iota of why we fly the flags on Labor Day, I have no clue. I work for a union. I can't even fathom why we'd fly the flags. But that's just what we do, because it's what we do. Well, you know, again, as, as I do this longer and longer, maybe why we do what we do shouldn't be quite so cut and dry. Oh, it's a day off work? Well, then that means you fly a flag. It's not a day off work. You don't fly a flag. It's not. That's not what it should be about. And I appreciate that there are many, many nuances, and probably you know, other people who may have had families involved in New York may feel differently. They may want a whole bunch of flags to be flying to, to make sure it's clear that they're lost of that day. So there is no right answer, and therefore, um, and as much as I like to imagine that I might have thought of it by now, I think the compromise, while it does lend itself to discussion as, you know, Either it is or it isn't. Well, actually, it is or it isn't in Amherst. We do have it always in Amherst. And so I'm, I'm pleased to continue with a compromise rather than forcing a vote that says, yes, it so happens that the majority of people sitting here at this board tonight might support this because I don't want the next time this comes up, a majority of the people on the board who say absolutely not, not ever, not even once on September 11th to happen because that would be easy to accom that would be easy to have happen and I think would be very unfortunate. So I think by not following the spirit of compromise now, we set ourselves up for that sort of thing in the future. So much as I'd like things to be a little more simple, I don't think they can be. And I'm fine with the three or five year or whatever compromise we think is currently appropriate. Thank you. I appreciate the point you made about kind of the, the makeup of the board. You know, if you're if you're gonna kinda play the makeup of the board game that, that 
uh, that's a slippery slope, um, as we've talked about it before, in, in terms of attendance. You know, there are certain right. things and certain times back when we didn't have such good attendance as we have now, you could get a different outcome if you had a different vote on different nights. That's that's not how the select board, the, the executive branch of government in town is supposed to work. And so I, I think that um, honoring the compromise um, honors the spirit of that. Um, really, we are making the decision on behalf of the town. This is the town's decision, uh, the town's representation of the flags on that day, and all of our best information at this point, both historically and with our, our own body, is that this is a point that the town is still divided on, so the compromise seems to make the most sense. I understand it's not something you're divided on. You only see it one way, but there are... Anyone here tonight? There were 60 people here on September 10th, 2001, and I think it was most people agree it was slightly more in favor of flying the flags more often than less often, although the select board voted differently that night, but it was it was a packed room that night. And, and if I may, just for one second, just to address what Ms. Stein said, because uh, I mean, one of the most iconic photos of that day, and we know how many millions were taken that day, is those two firefighters raising the flag over the burning rubble around 6 p.m. and those two firefighters had been searching all day for survivors. I don't think they found any, but they were also searching for their fellow firefighters because at that point, CNN and Fox and everybody else was reporting possibly thousands of firefighters were dead, thousands. And these guys are exhausted. They're dealing with molten steel and missing comrades and missing civilians. And they, that, I mean, they knew what was, how bad this thing was and what did they do? They raised an American flag, and they just happened to do it with somebody nearby who took that picture. So, I mean, you can say, yeah, it's a trivial thing, and 9-11 and, and was such a horrific thing, but it, to me, it impacted no one more so than firefighters, which, and yeah, obviously, I'll be at the Amherst Fire Station for, for their service, and they lost 343, you know, police officers lost 40-something. But as I said, you know, the, the, when it first drove it home to me was pre way, way before 9-11, it was December of 1999 when those firefighters went into that Worcester building and didn't come out. And I drove down there to see that, what the fire chief called the building from hell, and I just had to see it for myself. And I drove down there about a week after the uh, tr Worcester fire tragedy, and I have never, never seen so many American flags as I was driving to Worcester. Never. Even after 9-11. It did not compared to what I saw in Worcester. So, Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'll note that we did have two members of the public submit comment about this, both of whom were, uh, were arguing in favor of flying the flag every day, uh, every 9-11. Um, and is there anyone from the public here now who would like to comment on this issue? No? Okay. So it seems to me that we don't need a vote because we're not going to, we're, it, the indications seem to be that we're not looking to make a change from current policy. Does anybody feel differently and wants to have a vote? Could you just, just restate what the current policy so is? So the current policy again? is that we fly them every five years to be all of the uh, the years that mark five and ten, et cetera, uh, anniversaries at five-year intervals. So in keeping with that current policy, the next time they would fly on 9-11 would be 2016. Okay, any other comment before we move on from this? Ms. Stein. I just want to say from an educational point of view that I honestly believe that a child would ask more often why the firehouse bells are ringing, why people are standing there, why flags are at half mast, that the flags flying I don't think generate the same response because they've been so accepted. Thank you. Mr. Hayden. A, a comment which is maybe a step back. Uh, in appreciation for Mr. Kelly's um, bringing up issues often uh, to us, um, I kind of, I, I, at first I thought, oh my goodness. Um, and then I realized that um, this is an opportunity for us to really sort of put our heads together and be thoughtful out loud about important issues, clearly important issues. And so I, I, I do appreciate that opportunity and I want to echo your appreciation for my colleagues in sort of taking it in hand and not just dismissing it, not just sort of saying, oh, yeah. Mr. Winslow, please identify yourself at the mic for folks at home. Reynolds Winslow, Precinct 1. I wasn't, I, I 
I have no, I, I'm not even sure what I'm going to say, but uh, this august body might consider tabling this motion and reinventing itself for the town. I'm old enough to remember Pearl Harbor. My grandchildren are old enough to remember 9-11. I think this town has the opportunity to educate young people. Now, I'm part of the Human Rights Commission, have been so for a long time, and I dare say that if somebody comes to my commission, our commission, to represent all of us, and brings this topic before us, we have an obligation to consider this very topic. And I dare say, if I encourage people to come and voice their opinion, this could turn it upside down. And I would hope that somebody in our town would consider this. This is more than the topic is more than I have, uh, probably more than I have a right to even mention. But as a citizen, as an American citizen, as a black American, you will appreciate a different aspect of life in Amherst in being all inclusive and reaching out to a majority of people, the majority of people, that are affected by what happens in Amherst. We are an unusual town, I submit, a body of thinkers, and as I remember and have, have attended town meetings, there are opinions galore. So I'm requesting that you don't come to rush to a judgment of table, not, ta not tabling this. I would hope that you would table this reconsider and think very hard, even prayerfully, if I might add that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't think we need a motion to table or otherwise. This is, uh, we're simply taking no action to make any changes uh, to the current policy. Um, as always, we welcome additional information on this topic and you can be sure Mr. Kelly will bring it back again next year at this time. Um, <laughs> and, and he should do that. Um, as I said, the, the information that we have to work with as far as what the town's opinion is on this is an incredibly lopsided vote at town meeting that said absolutely not and at a nearly uh, half and half divided select board on this representing the community as best we can uh, despite Mr. Kelly bringing this to us every single year. We really don't get any comment on this. We don't get comment after the fact. You know, some people, they like to kind of oversimplify this, and, you know, kind of give us little jabs or whatever uh, in the press or, or in, uh, pop culture. But, uh, but nobody, nobody really comments on this. So we got two comments this year. We've had one or two people come to the various hearings we've had about this in the past. I think it would be a very different discussion if Mr. Kelly were to bring it back for another town meeting vote. You might have a totally different result. If we were to have a groundswell of people coming from Human Rights Commission or other places that were representing a different point of view, we would have different information to work with. But the information we have to work with now uh, is that you know kind of the silence is speaking to the fact that um, that the compromise that represents the town is is the best place to be right now but thank you very much for your comments okay moving on it is 841 and our next item is the 815 item proof plan and process for filling library trustee vacancy In our packets, we have, let me see, where is my history? Okay, we have a document. This is the same document that I provided to us last January when we were looking at um, filling a vacancy on the school committee. This describes the process that we have used in, uh, in the past several years for how we handle the filling of a vacancy, both as it relates specifically to Mass General Law that governs it and what we do um, 
within that law to, uh, to take the steps necessary to have an election. There is a new vacancy, as I mentioned at the last meeting, and as folks have all read in the paper, there is a vacancy on the library trustees. And uh, we thank Emily Lewis for her long service and excellent service there. Um, but she has now moved away, and there is a vacancy. The chair of the library trustees in uh, consultation with his colleagues has requested that we hold an election on September 24th, that is two meetings from now, to fill that vacancy. That uh, is a uh, is a good amount of time both being in excess of the week's notice required by mass general law but also allowing the trustees to try and fill that vacancy kind of as soon as reasonably practical so they can have a new person on board uh, that person would serve until the annual town election and then need to be uh, either reelected or, or that seat would be up for election at that time so the recommendation to us is to fill that seat uh, at an election here, time to be determined on September 24th and to follow the process at, that has worked so well for us in the past several years. Questions or comments? Thoughts about the 24th, are we all good with that? Okay, Ms. Brewer? Um, I, sorry, I didn't reread this as carefully as I should have. What responsibility are level do we take on mainly because we have the excellent staff support to make it happen which you know is kind of like a punishment to them sometimes too um, in terms of making sure this is widely broadcast versus it being up to the library trustees to do that versus the school committee another year ARA etc I mean how do you how do we envision our level of responsibility of getting this out there and what that might like. So tomorrow, assuming we approve this information tomorrow or Wednesday, we will get onto the town website a news release that has right. the information about this, and uh, and really we kind of depend on the publicity that comes from this meeting and the fact that the library trustees are kind of best connected to folks who may be interested in serving on their body to be spreading the word. Okay. If you have other recommendations, then by all but means. But basically, then. it basically it is the news release, and then um, it, as it says here, the letters of interest come to the select board, which I think is still the far more sensible thing than other things we've tried in the past. And um, we just direct everybody toward that news release, or to talk to the library trustees themselves about it. That sounds good. Correct. So, uh, so the uh, election will be held at the Monday, September 24th meeting. The deadline for letters of interest would be at 4 p.m. on the Thursday prior to that meeting. So that would be 23, 24, 20. Uh, September 20th is the deadline for letters of interest. Uh, those letters of interest should be sent to the select board office either by regular mail at Town Hall for Boltwood Avenue, Amherst, Mass. 1002, or at the select board's email, which is selectboard at amherstma.gov. Uh, should uh, letters of interest tr trickle in to the trustees instead, we are good at coordinating that uh, information and we'll make sure that both the select board members and the library trustees get all of that information as soon as it comes in. Um, and then depending on the number of candidates we have for that seat, we would either go with the process exactly as, uh, as detailed here, or you'll recall when we had the school committee candidates last time, we had a very large number of <laughs> candidates and we actually had to reduce some of the times. I think it was like the opening statements were one minute instead of two minutes or whatever. Um, once we get all of the applicants in, uh, I send them an email that describes the whole process so they understand what to expect on that Monday night. And uh, this has been working really pretty well for us the last couple of years. So between the select board and the office, uh, we have it down uh, down pat, and uh, and we bring whatever board with a vacancy uh, along with us pretty well. Ms. Brewer. I remembered what I really wanted to ask. I knew it would take a while, but I got there. So one thing we found with the school committee um, this last time, or at least that I noticed, is that one of the funny things about doing these vacancies is it actually gives someone or somebody some uh, or somebody the ability to define what they think the role of one of these people is whether it's a, whether it's a library trustee or a school committee member or an ARA member because that information can be provided in the news release um, that's not something that really even happens during an election there is like no definition that somebody publishes and says is this what you're gonna do um, so there was some confusion <laughs> in a previous time as to what 
you know, what the schools were saying and what the town was saying as to what this was. And so I guess I'm just asking that since it's all going through the select board office, that the library trustees be directed that if there's something particular that they think is important to include, because you know it is their body, um, as to characteristics or timing or any of those mm -hmm. things, because I think we've all seen letters of interest that just say, I like the library, I should serve. Well, you know that doesn't really give me anything to work with. But if we don't give people anything to work with other than there's an opening, you know, so it's that balance. I don't want to make it a lot of work, but I, I, I want it to not feel like the library trustees are going to put out one press release and we're going to put out another one. So Mr. Serrett and I are coordinating tomorrow Excellent. on this information, um, and so it will be whatever we coordinate on. So that will be the basics plus whatever he wants to add. Um, at the same time, then you have no control over what people submit they, if they just say, I want to. Sure. And then it, that's up to all of us to consider, you know, give the weight that, that we think is necessary uh, along with their the public interview that we do here. But I think that I think that the process as we planned it will address your concerns about the, the body including any information that they think is key. And I think I would just like you to add to your beautiful list here of current as of 2012, some statement to that effect that the, the chair will coordinate with the other chair or something like that on that because that hasn't been clear um, to you know non-amazing chairs like you, so how that might work. So just for future reference, because it does seem to come up every two years maybe. We've had a few of these lately. Okay, thank you. Mr. Heaton? I'm enjoying the, uh, the word puzzle, a committee of chairs. That's kind of fun. Yes. Um, the, um, I also I want to sort of reinforce what Ms. Brewer says, remembering from the school committee um, um, interview, if you will, um, that uh, one of the first things that, that we learned was exactly what the school committee was up to for the, f the, the, the six months that you know what, what did they need to get done in those six months and that was important and it's kind of a nice idea to get ahead of that okay. i will note that with mr serrett any other questions or comments all right i don't think we need a formal vote on this we just agree that that will take place at our september 24th meeting and that the time of that will be as best i can coordinate with mr serrett and, and the availability yeah. of the trustees presumably we're all already here so that will work for us Okay, very good, thank you. Moving along, we have oh, town manager evaluation and goal setting process. Yes, it's like Groundhog Day here at Select Board <laughs> Meeting. <laughs> okay, first of all, we have uh, in our packets what I hope is the final version of the uh, evaluation memo. Um, I didn't get the draft of that to folks as soon last week as I'd expected to. In fact, I didn't get it to you until yesterday. Um, but uh, th that was the best I can do. I apologize. If there are any significant changes that you want to make to it, we certainly can. If there are insignificant changes, then perhaps that they're not relevant. Um, but I did my best to collect all of the information that we talked about adding at our last meeting. Um, and I had highlighted those two in the draft that I sent. Um, so, so first of all, we'll see, are we good with the, the final version of this or do we want to make any changes? I am good with it. Good with it, okay. Everyone's good with it unless I hear otherwise from someone. Okay, in which case, let's <laughs> like talk about it a different way. So that means that at long last, we have concluded our <laughs> FY12 town manager evaluation process. I want to, folks have already read kind of the preview of this in the paper because our discussion at the August 20th meeting did go into kind of great detail about the, the guts of the evaluation, if you, if you will. Um, but uh, the bottom line is uh, we had another excellent year from Mr. Musanti and we thank him very much for his service. The uh, performance in all areas was high. We identified just a couple of areas that we were looking for uh, additional attention to in the coming year and uh, I hope that that information is helpful to him because that's what the evaluation process is supposed to be all about is to help identify the the, the things that we want him to keep doing as well as he is doing and to uh, to to try and make everything be exactly that well um, 
So this has been a long and thoughtful process, as it always is. We had uh, public comment as well as staff comment. And again, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of the folks who submitted comment from the public and, and staff and others uh, for this. This is, as I said last week, this is the most important thing that the select board does. This is our opinion on the management of the town on behalf of the community. This is trying to see if the the values that we hold and, and the ways we assess his performance are in line with uh, the community's goals. And uh, so to, to the degree that we think that they are, we think he's doing a heck of a job. So uh, are, are there other details folks want to go into about this? I should note that all of this information is on the tab in the web packet online and tomorrow all of this will be moved to the select board not moved to it will stay in the packet but it will also be on the resource section at the bottom of the select boards page on the website uh, that resource section always is updated with our our current kind of critical documents so at this point the FY11 evaluation is up there but that will now move into the archive still accessible from that same area but not uh, available right on that page um, and be replaced with this one um, so uh, in addition to the uh, the composite memo that is in fact kind of serves as the official evaluation that is the summary of all of the comments and ratings from the individual select board members forms uh, as we talked about in great detail last week that is that collects everything that was identified either in our forms or in our discussion last week of areas of broad agreement. And because we have no individual authority, it's only in the areas of broad agreement that we actually provide any kind of direction to the town manager. So that is to uh, that is what the memo is for, so that he's not trying to figure out from five different evaluation forms, what are they looking for from me? What is this saying? However, uh, it the public does have access to all five of our individual forms. Those are currently in the web packet and, uh, as I said, will be with the evaluation material in the resource section of the page tomorrow. And I think that that, uh, tr too, is very critical information to the community about whether we individually are, um, are, are being responsible in what we do and, uh, and whether it aligns with their thinking. So I think it's all good information to have. And... Uh, and I'm so happy to be done with this for <laughs> for this year. Uh, other questions or comments about the evaluation for FY12? Woohoo! Thank you, Mr. Musanti. Really, it's a it's been it's been a great year. Uh, I appreciate it. I'll just uh, very briefly say my thanks to the board. Uh, you know the effort you've made on behalf of the community and your effort in particular on this tool, going back a couple of years now. Um, well, can be uh, stressful at times during the uh, extended process um, is very helpful to me uh, collectively as well as the individual feedback um, and you know positive reinforcement is great but also identifying areas to pay uh, additional attention to in the coming year is very very helpful to me I just appreciate the confidence uh, you've placed in me and through you the wider community and and the confidence of the staff and just reiterating the fact that most of what you know I've been able to contribute to in terms of progress as town manager wouldn't happen without the day-to-day uh, -day commitment and effort of uh, each and every uh, employee of the town of Amherst so that's very very important and I'm enjoying the job immensely and looking forward to uh, continuing our forward uh, momentum and progress Thank you very much. Following tonight's meeting, we will have an executive session to talk about uh, any contract changes for Mr. Musanti in the wake of this evaluation. All right, any questions or comments about this before we move on to goal setting? Ms. Burr. Um, sorry, remind me when we're going to talk about process for next year. Just Reviewing our evaluation process? Yeah. September 10th. That's right. Thank you. I know it's coming up. Yep. So, uh, so uh, I had sent this in an email, but um, by all means, while this is fresh in our minds, if you have any thoughts about how we do this better, because we're always just trying to do it better, then, uh, then note them down and we will talk about them at our September 10th meeting. Okay, so <laughs> now it's time for our FY13 goals discussion because 
I think the most critical thing that the select board did starting a couple years ago with the evaluation was to make it based on actual goals. You know, an evaluation that's based on, you know, nothing in particular uh, doesn't have a ton of value. So one of the things that we tried to do was to uh, really identify and then formally codify our goals for the town manager. We have been doing this all summer long because uh, it does work very well in parallel with the evaluation process because we are paying attention to all those elements of performance. Um, at our previous meetings, we first had a discussion about our goals from last year and whether we wanted to keep, eliminate, or revise any of them uh, for FY13, <coughs> and the decision at that time was to keep all of them as is, and we had thorough discussion about that. At another meeting, we talked about whether there were new goals that we wanted to add to this list, and at that time, we determined no, that this list uh, broadly captured the things that we wanted to do. Um, we knew that we would have at least this one more goals discussion, and if we need another one, then we will do that, to revisit both of those discussions uh, in the wake of having finished our individual evaluations and what kinds of new thoughts that made us think or what kinds of uh, issues that brought to mind. And we do know from our discussion last week that we identified a couple of areas that would help for us to clarify them uh, among ourselves before we can expect to evaluate Mr. Musianti on them. So um, let's start with any additional goals because that's a little bit easier. Ms. Stein. Stephanie, I would be, I see these two as so linked and I would hope that we could discuss both of them on September 10th. Um, to be totally honest, I only got back into town late today and I really want time to go back to my notes that I was trying to keep. They're little, there's not much. If you wanna go ahead with it, fine. But I'm not in a position to really seriously look at these goals again. The only point that I could make right now would be um, again linked to the evaluation process. When we have parts A, B, C, and D, are we supposed to address A, B, C, and D, or are we supposed to have sort of a composite paragraph that incorporates them? Because I tried to do A, B, C, and D. Um, but the particles within, I don't, I'm not prepared to really discuss those this evening. Okay, um, we've been so uh, thorough about this so far. There's no reason to rush it. We, I, they are certainly broadly a continuation of the goals from the previous year, so it's not like Mr. Musanti suddenly won't know what he's doing for the next couple of weeks <laughs> if we don't <laughs> <laughs> He's dependent on those. <laughs> <laughs> Lord help him. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so Just presumably guess. no one has a problem with postponing uh, this discussion until the September 10th meeting. Okay, I'm good with that. Very good, Ms. Burr. I think, and, and it's so perfect with segues because i just written myself a note. I have two things on my list for next time, and the second thing was, I think that in, in deference to the fact of your abilities as chair versus normal human beings in the future, um, and since you've already given us to understand that you won't be here for the next 50 or 60 years, is that we do need to decide that issue associated with, is a box, mm -hmm. not that we want to think outside the box and all that, but is a box, are those little separate things <coughs> that need to be rated? Because if, if you're rating them separately and I'm rating them one way and somebody's trying to turn those into numbers somehow, it's gonna screw everything up. So um, it's probably just in terms of setting ourselves up for simplicity's sake. Okay. So, and then that defines what our actual goals look like as well. Very good, all part of the discussion next time then. Anything else we wanna add to this before we uh, move I, on? I, I, I know time is, is growing short and we have lots and lots of stuff to do. I just one word, very quick thing. It's it's very gratifying <coughs> that what we're talking about is whether it should be ABCD with its four boxes or one box. Yep. What we're not discussing and reading the last issue about municipal governments is whether or not we got every job listed here sort of in a broad category. Um, and I think we've done a very good job. On the 10th, I wanna talk about maybe expanding or, or, or clarifying some sections, but I think that's sort of the crux of it. Okay, so I would ask my colleagues to please 
think about this in depth ahead of time and to the degree that you can bring suggestions <laughs> raising problems <laughs> identifying problems that's all well and good but suggestions are what make changes so please bring real suggestions um, and, and maybe for some things you won't have a suggestion you say you know I've identified this as a problem we need to we need to think about I understand that that sometimes mm -hmm. that happens but to the degree that we can actually be working with suggestions would be very very helpful all right we'll discuss this more on September 10th you done okay next then Town Manager's Report, Mr. McCann. Uh, thank you. I have several items to uh, plow through, and I'll try to do those quickly. Uh, first is a brief uh, staff update. I have two items. One, uh, really pleased to publicly announce, I've let the board know by email uh, in the last couple of days. I have uh, hired uh, Leslie Salisbury uh, to a uh, part-time position, 12 hours a week, uh, human rights coordinator reporting to our new human rights and human resources director, uh, Deb Radway. Uh, Leslie started back with us today, uh, and we're working out her hours. It'll be some sort of flex time schedule uh, that works for her and works for the town. I know sh the current plan is for her to have regular uh, hours in town hall uh, on Mondays uh, 9 to 1 but then other hours uh, uh, more flexible including hours out directly out in the community outside of this building um, she'll be working very closely with Deb Radway in a in a support role uh, and also as a uh, uh, staff liaison along with uh, Deb Radway to the Human Rights Commission. Um, um, and so we're very, very excited about uh, Leslie rejoining us. You, any people in, in town uh, uh, know Leslie from her excellent work a couple years back now, uh, being our primary uh, uh, administrator on a uh, sh social justice grant that was awarded to the town uh, to our health department. There was a lot of community engagement uh, and staff engagement as part of that work. She did a great job and just thrilled to have her back and looking forward to her work. Um, secondly, I just wanted to recognize our principal assessor, uh, David Burgess. Uh, at the end of July, he was recognized formally by the, his statewide association, the Mass Association of Assessing Officers. Yes, we have an association <laughs> statewide for most every uh, 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 job category in town. Dave was recognized uh, for his excellent work uh, last year assisting the town of Munson following the uh, 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 tornadoes and the you know, many problems confronting the town of Munson, including you know, his colleagues in the assessing that function down there, just their ability to literally function. So Dave uh, spent some significant time down there helping and uh, his unselfishness and, and uh, desire to help were recognized. So I just wanted the community and the board to be aware of that uh, as well. Uh, next, uh, in terms of updates, uh, in addition to my bulleted list that's on the agenda, I want to lead off with uh, uh, news that is official as of this morning. I uh, have in fact signed the town's uh, power purchase agreement with Blue Wave Capital and Smart Energy Capital, the uh, development partners to develop solar power uh, and install a solar array at our old landfill off of Belchertown Road. Uh, this was the project that was overwhelmingly endorsed by town meeting a year ago, giving me authorization to negotiate a longer term agreement. We periodically updated the select board on its progress, including a very extensive uh, uh, update at your July meeting. Uh, today was a real milestone day. We've, we've now executed this agreement. Uh, uh, it will give us a uh, uh, renewable source of electricity to meet municipal and school needs over the next 25 years at a very low competitive price. 
Uh, so there's financial savings, there's a tremendous environmental benefit uh, that is the equivalent, equivalent of taking nearly 9,000 cars off of our roads. Uh, the next steps uh, are development of a detailed design and the real active engagement of uh, people in the community, including in the immediate neighborhood. Uh, to come up with a final design for this that is directly sensitive to uh, uh, concerns such as uh, proximity to lot lines, uh, uh, other buffering and screening, uh, continued access to uh, walking trails, et cetera. So we're, we're very excited about that, and that will be a precursor to uh, the permit applications themselves to the local ZBA and the state DEP. Uh, for a very rigorous uh, environmental review. So milestone day, very excited about taking another step forward. We're also in the same press release that's on the website, uh, uh, very close to uh, uh, signing a letter of intent uh, with the same development group to uh, potential, potentially purchase some of our electricity power from a second site located in a different town. Uh, that is not yet final, but it's imminent. Um, and that will uh, uh, be another positive step, giving us flexibility on sources and also assisting us in our efforts to uh, appropriately size the footprint of this solar array uh, so that it's in a, uh, uh, you know, as less of an impact as possible while still meeting the needs of the town and the greater community uh, at the old landfill. Um, we expect construction would, if the permit process continues on, to start uh, currently estimated uh, third quarter of calendar 13, and that follows the state and local uh, permit process uh, that would uh, precede it. Um, so I'm happy about that. You know, we also have the litigation, as you know, uh, overhanging this issue. That litigation is still active. I have twin goals uh, to successfully reach uh, uh, a uh, design for this project that clearly safeguards any environmental concerns uh, that people locally and people at the regulatory level have. Uh, uh, satisfactorily um, and uh, meet the mitigation uh, concerns that have been expressed. And also want to uh, be given the opportunity to prove uh, as a town that we can, we can pursue a solar array at this site that is uh, uh, environmentally safe and fits in with the uh, uh, community in which it's placed. Ms. Brewer. Uh, thank you for that beautiful segue. I know that, um, and one of the shorthand sort of pokes that um, Ms. O'Keefe kind of referenced earlier associated with our flag discussion mm -hmm. that we occasionally get out in the community is associated with meetings with neighbors associated with this project. And my response has typically been, well, it's pretty hard to meet with people who are suing you. And um, that's blunter than anything you would normally say. But I appreciate that you just tried to address that because obviously you can't sit down with a neighborhood that is suing you, that it, some portion of is suing you, to have the same kinds of conversations if they weren't. So this is a difficult challenge to be working on both this process and the litigation at the same time. And so I just want the community to understand that in perhaps a more blunt way than the town manager would state it, that it is, it is a challenge he is rising to, but it is a difficult challenge. It would perhaps a somewhat different series of meetings might have taken place were it not for the litigation also being a factor. Would that be safe to say? Uh, sure. And uh, yeah, this project is hard to do, but it's such a worthwhile project uh, directly to the community and for the greater good uh, that it's worth pursuing. I've made clear, and you've supported me along the way and the town along the way, that we were going to make every possible effort to bring forward a project to the permitting authorities that is directly sensitive to the issues that have been raised. And so the completion of the power purchase agreement with the appropriate uh, terms and conditions and safeguards 
um, is a precursor to those in-depth uh, discussions, but I'm ready, able, and willing uh, to really have those uh, very site-specific uh, uh, discussions with uh, all those who are willing to have them uh, with the town. I just want to emphasize that, um, first of all, Mr. Musetti has been willing to meet with these folks all along, and uh, even though, as Ms. Brewer acknowledged, it, it is challenging in these circumstances, um, it, the, the power purchase agreement being finalized and the stage of another uh, potential agreement with a different town that changes everything, and that changes the ability to have those conversations with the neighbors. And I think it's really important to emphasize that looking to purchase power from an array in another town is directly in response to the fact that these neighbors have raised concerns. That gives us the flexibility to potentially reduce the size of the array at our old landfill um, and still get our power needs met by doing that off-site. So I really think that the town manager n needs to get a, a ton of due credit there for the fact that uh, that is directly in response to the concerns that folks have raised. So I hope that those I hope that folks will, uh, will accept his his offer to meet and that those conversations can be very fruitful because this is really the opportunity to say okay, how do we make this solar array that the town, the community, has expressed such overwhelming support for, how do we make this work best for the neighborhood as well? And so this is a really important step to be at, and, uh, and those will be great conversations. Thank you. Great. Uh, next, uh, Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative. Uh, uh, the chair's suggestion, uh, we want to add this to be uh, a monthly update or more frequent as needed, I guess. Um, um, so uh, recapping some recent developments uh, uh, earlier in August, uh, uh, under my signature, uh, we sent a letter of uh, request out to every residential property owner in Amherst asking for their help in updating property information, particularly around whether the property is owner-occupied and uh, if not, if it's rented, what are, the, what are the number of units and the appropriate uh, contact people uh, for such properties. I know as of last count that I saw the other day, we were well over 1,000 uh, responses thus, so thus far in the week to 10 days. This letter's been out on the street uh, and so uh, Julie Fetterman, health director, John Thompson, uh, code enforcement uh, official in the inspection services department, uh, public safety staff and others are all very appreciative of this as an ongoing dialogue. Uh, uh, Ms. Fetterman, our building commissioner, Rob Mora, uh, uh, John Thompson also were before the planning board recently and gave them an update on various initiatives. Uh, uh, the university, uh, uh, and, and the other two uh, other colleges are, are in the midst of their uh, ramping up and orientation programs for the beginning of the fall semester. Uh, UMass uh, is having the entire freshman class on campus for a couple of days later this week well before the rest of the on-campus student body returns. There's a whole elaborate orientation program that's been revised uh, last year and this year that has as one of its fundamental planks in it uh, town gown uh, expectations and uh, a positive kind of what can you do to help be a, a most responsible member of the community. And uh, the other, uh, another major initiative on the part of the university I want to offer my uh, enthusiastic support for is the hiring of six off-campus student ambassadors who will be working with their peers and with neighbors out in neighborhoods primarily mo closest to the university on day-to-day -day, uh, neighborhood issues and helping communicate uh, uh, back and forth and, and promote that dialogue between neighbors and our, our many young people in town. So I think that's all very positive and the university is to be uh, commended for that. Um, 
before you move on from that, sure. um, I'll just note that um, just a, a tiny correction, it's five uh, student life oh, coordinators sorry, off campus. Five, sorry. It's fine. Um, and so part of the reason of, of having the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods report be a monthly update and kind of a theme that you'll see running through the chair's report, that's a document that I put on your desks late tonight and isn't on the website yet, but will be tomorrow, is the need for both the town and the university to be better communicating all of the steps we are taking jointly and individually to deal with <coughs> the very real issues of off-campus behavior. Um, I gave you a couple of things in your packet. I won't talk about them now, but um, well, I guess I might as well just s I'll briefly touch on them. Um, there's a door hanger as well as a, a uh, multicolored brochure. These are being distributed by the newly formed, as of last year, off-campus student, off-campus student center, off-campus student center, that's what it's called. Um, th there has been a complete rearrangement in the Dean of Students Office and the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs under her uh, responsibilities and they are just completely taking a new look at these things so the brochure and the door hangers are being distributed through a tremendous coordination with landlords that's to make sure that students are aware and uh, to have the message constantly reinforced about campus policies, town bylaws, and the consequences for violating both. The list of activities that the town and the university do are doing in this regard, both to, uh, to educate, um, to reinforce, and to hold students accountable, it's a very long list. Uh, it's been a great deal of work, and we're clearly not doing a good enough job getting that message out there to folks. Mm -hmm. I know when I spoke with Applewood last year, whenever that was, I was talking uh, to them about the initiatives between the, the university and the town to deal with these issues, and to a person, they were all so happy to hear this because this is a concern everybody has, but they don't realize that we're working on it. So. Uh, the university is trying to do a better job to, to let people know. The town, we need to be doing a better job to let people know because as long as people think that this isn't an issue that we're taking seriously and that this isn't something we're addressing, then they're going to um, perceive the problems to be you know, even worse, that, that not being responsive becomes part of the problem. But in fact, responsiveness uh, is there, people are taking this very seriously. And so you'll be hearing more about that um, from Mr. Musanti's now monthly safe and healthy neighborhoods uh, reports and, and other information as necessary. So that's all, thank you. Great, on to easy topics like uh, taxi regulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just coming attractions, uh, you know that when uh, taxi licenses were renewed for both uh, drivers and, uh, and companies in the current year that we set an expectation that we would spend time this year thoroughly reviewing those regulations and developing uh, recommended revisions to them for your consideration uh, that also uh, have an opportunity for uh, uh, direct uh, uh, feedback from uh, those affected, the, the taxi operators themselves. And so I want to give you a rough timeline. Um, been working very closely with uh, Deborah Roussel and Chief Livingstone uh, and uh, planning staff uh, inspection services staff as needed on this. Uh, we're having our next such uh, dis review this Thursday. Our, our goal is to have draft uh, recommendations uh, to you and out to the uh, taxi companies themselves, the current license holders, uh, and post it on the website, all that, uh, by September 14th. Um, we then intend to have one or more meetings with taxi operators to review those uh, draft regulations and uh, get face-to-face -face, uh, feedback as well as written feedback uh, to them. Our goal is to uh, bring this to you uh, no later than your October 15th select board meeting uh, where you'll have a review of draft. Uh, won't be asking you to take any votes at that meeting, but begin the select board portion formally of the review and then uh, ideally at your November 5th meeting be in a position to uh, take action on updated regulations, uh, giving us the last two months of the year for 
uh, notification and the office staff going through our process of getting applications received and processed in time for you to approve them in a timely way for January 1st implementation. Great, thank you. Ms. Brewer? J just to um, clarify one particular point, we are still, one very specific thing that we are still planning to do is, um, tell me the term, I'm the the metering. problem, metering, because I was just reminded of that, seeing that the, the uh, green caps in, over in Northampton had been purchased by another group right. and they were still talking about doing zones and I was like, yeah, but we're not gonna be doing that, so. We're definitely, um, but we're definitely pursuing That's yours. very much in the draft okay. at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, next, uh, a number of uh, public works related updates. First, uh, the Safe Routes to School project uh, in and around the Wildwood School and middle school areas uh, is essentially complete uh, and um, in time for the start of school. Uh, there's a number of components to this. The uh, East Pleasant Street uh, crosswalk at the corner of Strong Street has been uh, upgraded and the, uh, the ramp on the East Pleasant Street side of the sidewalk has been brought to the appropriate uh, ADA compliant you know, uh, uh, pitch. Um, the sidewalk on Strong Street from East Pleasant to the entrance of Wildwood has been refurbished um, the sidewalk on the Wildwood driveway has been uh, refurbished as well. Uh, there's also a new bike parking area that's been created on the front of Wildwood School to the right near the corner of the side lot there and the main driveway uh, that we think the uh, uh, kids will, will like. Um, then on the uh, middle school half of the project, the Chestnut Street uh, uh, crosswalks at the, you know, intersection there, which is uh, quite a thoroughfare at, you know, opening and closing bell of school. Uh, handicapped accessible curb cuts, sidewalks, appropriate safe pavement markers are all complete. Uh, handicapped accessible curb cuts have been refurbished uh, on the sidewalk directly in front of the middle school. And there's a new sidewalk along the far end of the parking lot at the at the middle school where the ball field is uh, that uh, is also in place. So that's all good. Nice little project, state funded. Uh, very happy about that. Uh, sewer extension schedule, Harkness Road and Wild Flower Drive areas. Uh, there was some follow up uh, suggestions from our last meeting. Uh, to, so first on Harkness. Uh, the construction of the sewer extension is now scheduled for calendar 2013 instead of the current year, which was the original plan. <coughs> uh, a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the sewer line route itself uh, has been uh, changed uh, in direct response to uh, some neighborhood feedback about the particular route that triggered a re some redesign work and hence the uh, uh, delay on construction. The neighbors have been notified and they're supportive of, <coughs> the, of the redesign and the, and the timeline. Uh, Wildflower Drive, the Amherst Woods area, uh, that construction is expected to proceed uh, in the fall of 2013 as originally uh, scheduled. Uh, and so that's an update on sewers. So just to follow up a little bit on that. So. Um, it, the, the sequence had been as such because Harkness had an easier design. Wildflower <coughs> was gonna need two <coughs> design seasons, if I recall correctly yes. from um, Mr. Mooring, whereas Harkness was thought to be, um, it's a smaller area, simpler, uh, that the design and construction could happen in this season. So now it turns out that the, the design is happening and will continue, or I don't know if the design is done. The design is is uh, in progress, but it's proceeding at a good pace, and it's directly related to the feedback the department received when the conceptual design was 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 shown to those affected. And so, wildflowers um, installation is not being delayed by that because it was already going to be taking right. the. 
2012 and 2013 design seasons and yes and but with con installation to start in 2013 yes okay. and finish in 2013 and finish. so <laughs> so uh, so yeah. dpw or, or the contractor and whoever is going to be able to install both of these sewer systems next year yes yeah we'll bid this out actually i believe it's possible that wildflower was two halves in 2013 and 2014 i'm uh, no, we're we're uh, no. I, I'm I'm told 2013 on Wildflower. Okay, good. Other questions or comments about that? Okay, yeah. thank you for the update. Paving and road construction activities update. Um, the bad news is that there's some disruption that those construction projects cause. The good news is that it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's an update. Uh, bids are now in hand for our annual paving. Contract. I'll be signing those this week, uh, and you know the state completing its work on the transportation bond bill in Chapter 90 puts us in a position now to execute those contracts. So that's kudos to the legislature and governor for that. Um, we have a couple of different contracts. One of which will be for a company uh, that specializes in recycling pavement and putting it back down on the street. Uh, in kind of a one sequence. There's not one day is re reclaiming and another day is paving. It's all in one, one cycle. And there's certain types of roads in town that lend themselves to this technology. Um, so besides being uh, environmentally uh, sensitive, it's also cheaper per uh, uh, lane mile. So we're trying this out this year on Sunderland Road, a very long and straight and pothole-ridden road uh, that we're going to be using this technique on, as well as the short stretch of South Pleasant uh, directly in front of the common. Um, so you'll see that uh, this fall. Uh, Cottage Street drainage uh, is about to commence beginning on September 4th, corner of Cottage and Triangle, the perennial Every time we get a heavy rain, you see the uh, uh, sawhorses and barrels go up. Uh, we hope that becomes a uh, not so fond memory uh, soon. Uh, so the work, the drainage work, will start uh, September 4th and the paving immediately thereafter this fall. Uh, Cherry Lane, the sewer repair work is essentially complete, and the uh, just described paving contrast contract will include uh, repaving that uh, initial stretch of Cherry Lane from East Pleasant to approximately the Weaver Circle and um, um, uh, Main Street, a very uh, uh, important, ambitious project. Uh, the lower Main Street portion is uh, uh, well underway. The base coat of pavement from North Whitney to Northeast Street is complete. The contractor is now moving to uh, uh, sidewalks uh, and bus pull-off work. Um, the final paving date is to be determined because we're also in the midst of doing some final evaluation on phase two of the Main Street work, which is funded by Community Development Block Grant. That's the stretch from North Whitney to triangle, um, so those bids are currently under review. Uh, we're expecting that portion of the work to start in mid-September, uh, and we're going to get a final, final decisions on our preliminary uh, 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 description of paving and uh, the sidewalk work, et cetera. Uh, and I'll have further updates for you. And then just a reiteration that Lincoln Avenue, uh, the sewer work. Uh, will be happening this fall with application of a uh, base coat uh, before the snow flies and then uh, the final top coat of paving uh, in 2013. Questions or comments about paving updates? Mr. Hayden? Mr. Well, I'd like to back up a little bit um, to safe routes to school. I guess that's a paving, that's a paving thing. Yeah. Um, I just want to recall and, and again be appreciative of the, the various people that <coughs> whose efforts sure. allowed that to be, first the citizen group that put it together, and yes. then the work that DPW 
to make sure that it actually got to the, to the state so it could be funded and then their work to make sure it got done, uh, including all of the public hearings that we went to. Um, that was a, a great effort and I think really is a huge improvement to our neighborhoods as a result. Ms. Brewer. Absolutely, I'd ask for that update because I was down there at Wildwood School and I was That's like, awesome. look at all this, yeah. this is great. great. Yeah. So, um, a, a little sensitivity issue that I'm sure is obvious, but I just have to say it, because school starts next week, we have high schoolers driving out of the high school, we have parents, we have kids everywhere. Everybody has to readjust to that, and we're finally doing Cottage Street. Probably not the most ideal timing in the world, so I just would hope that, I mean, I'm glad, <laughs> super glad we're doing it, but I would just ask us to be super sensitive to the fact that kids are walking to the convenience store, and parents are driving like maniacs because they're late, and newly licensed drivers are going down there for the first time. If we could just make sure we're thorough with our signage and like sure. walk over here, don't walk over here, don't squish these people, that would be Yeah, super the road helpful. will be local traffic only. It's in the notice. The road will be local traffic only during the normal work day and then open to through traffic after, I think, 6 o'clock. There's yeah. just a lot of chaos there at the beginning and end of school day on a normal day. And right. so when you add in the fact that there's any construction going on or when you add in a flood, for example, so this will be awesome because you won't yes. have a flood anymore, um, just to be super thoughtful about that because people are yep. going to be confused and harried. Anything else on construction? Do you know anything uh, on Atkins that you can tell us? Could you um, Next stages? Um, well, the base code on the roundabouts are done. They're in service. Uh, the contractor is focusing on the uh, multi-purpose path is the official name of it uh, uh, on the Hampshire College side of, excuse me, 116 and other landscaping-related work. Uh, we're still awaiting word on the timing of the f uh, application of the final code of pavement. Um, I don't have an update on that. I don't have an answer on that yet. Uh, when that exactly will occur. Uh, there's also th additional signage and things like that that will be helpful. Um, the other component that isn't directly related to the state-funded Atkins portion, corner portion of the work, but uh, Guilford, uh, we've talked about uh, um, a small stretch of 116 in the vicinity of the Red Barn if you drive on 116, you know that the sight lines can be are poor. Uh, that road will be planed down uh, some amount uh, to improve the sight lines there, which has been a long-standing concern of, of the college, and the town will be doing that work uh, this fall. Thank you. Ms. Brewer? I'm sorry. The only thing I wanted to add about the Atkins, and I'm not just really sure how we do this beyond being you know, we all responding to the grocery store comments we get about it. But one, uh, it would it might be helpful if at some point, maybe when all the signage is done and so like a press release is done saying, wow, go look at this, you know, now it's got the final code, it's got all the signage, so anybody who was confused, it's really obvious how it's going to work. I, I think it works, but, you know, I'm used to the one in North Amherst now. Um, <laughs> is the complaints I'm, I'm hearing most, and I think have been referenced a little bit in the newspaper too, are, why was it designed this way when everybody knows 18-wheelers can't fit through here? Well, obviously that's not really a factual statement, but there's a lot of confusion associated with that and why things work the way they work and, you know, whether it's driver error or the fact that things get clogged up because people don't know when to yield and when not to. And I think signage is going to improve a lot of that and just the, the traffic flow in general. It just might be worth making a statement at some point that, how, how does one say, yes, we knew what we were doing when we designed this, and we did it this way on purpose, and it will work, but there are people who are convinced that we just totally got it wrong. And I don't know quite how to address that beyond just say, no, actually, we knew about those trucks, and we did account for that, and this is how it works. It's a state and local design process, and yeah. speed and accommodation for all size vehicle, including the big trucks, was taken into account, and that's what those... Uh, uh, aprons are on the interior right. of the roundabouts. Uh, right. It's not meant for you and I to drive our, you know, regular car right. over, but it is meant for an 18-wheeler who otherwise would not be able to negotiate the much narrower uh, roadway itself 
uh, they can go on to that apron uh, to help navigate the corner, and that was by design. That's why it's not grass. Right. Um, Maybe we just say that when right. it's all done again. Like um, that's why you'll see trucks driving over right. there. They're supposed to be doing that. And the design is is meant to uh, encourage you to slow down as you enter the roundabout. And uh, people in the roundabout, like a rotary, have the right of way. <laughs> the people entering the roundabout yield uh, to those. So that's part of the basics. And it, it'll be it's always a little bit getting used to, um, but it sure beats what was there forever. Not to belabor construction, but Mr. Alsasser's question about the back parking oh, lot. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the newly signed paving contract uh, includes uh, a relatively small but important job to uh, pave the driveway and, and uh, refurbished parking lot that will also have better lighting uh, in it uh, behind town hall. Uh, um, there was a bit of a hiccup uh, in that project uh, related to the gas line that runs to Town Hall, which will also service our about to be installed new generator. Um, we were uh, there was some research needed by the gas company about whether that need needed to be increased in size. It does not, so we're ready to proceed to paving, and now it's a matter of scheduling with the contractor. So Any it's coming. When that's done? It'll be certainly this fall. I don't have a precise date yet. Great. Okay. Uh, next, uh, um, um, in my role as uh, PVTA advisory board chair, uh, um, I'm. Uh, he is coming out to meet with the PVTA board uh, this Wednesday, the 29th. Uh, and we'll be talking and he'll be giving his views and we'll soliciting our views on uh, transportation uh, infrastructure and financing needs across the Commonwealth. Uh, the governor, the legislative leaders, uh, and the governor through Secretary Davey is out, uh, doing outreach uh, to the different constituencies. There was a meeting of <coughs> municipal leaders that I attended in Springfield last week. Uh, he's meeting with all the regional transit agencies because funding, uh, adequate and consistent funding for regional transit in this state is also a uh, structural problem that needs to be addressed. And so we're looking forward to that discussion with Secretary Davey on Wednesday, and I'll update you on how it goes. Uh, and it'll be very active uh, legislative uh, priority in the months ahead. And we'll also directly relate to uh, the future uh, decisions looming for the PVTA board on things like fare increases. That we had, a w we have a one-year fix with the help of the Commonwealth, but uh, we're now pushing for a permanent fix, and that's what this conversation is about. So I'll be updating you as we go along, um, and uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Questions or comments for Mr. Mazzoni? All right, then, member reports. So uh, you can talk as long as you want, but just bear in mind <laughs> that we have an executive <laughs> session coming up and we have a light agenda for September 10th. So I'm <laughs> just saying. Mm. All just right, saying. <laughs> liaison <laughs> reports, anyone? Ms. Very Stein. fast. <laughs> Kanagasaki Sister Committee had a very nice mm -hmm. event today at four o'clock in which um, Bessie, I think her last name is Young, who was a fellowship winner um, from 2011, a graduate of Amherst College, went to Japan to study how seniors are treated in um, uh, housing. Um, and it was very interesting. For example, a group home has only nine seniors in it because they believe individual attention is very important and consistency between the um, seniors and they staff, and these are seniors with Alzheimer's. So it was a very interesting talk, very well illustrated by slides, and very well attended. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Hayden. Just very two brief <coughs> reports. Uh, the um, TMCC has landed some new audio equipment for meeting rooms. I guess that's arriving in a couple of weeks to try to <coughs> help make meetings that are not um, 
um, uh, televised, uh, more easily heard by members of the audience. It's actually a very nice list of equipment, I have to say. Um, also, I met with the, um, the Recycling and Refuse mm, MC, Materials Committee, uh, Management Committee, and um, they're getting, they're really beginning to get some traction with dealing with what's going to happen when all the local landfills are closed, which turns out to be um, closer than we had thought. The, the recent lawsuits against the, um, the landfill in South Hadley and Northampton um, suggest that they will not be available to us for the next five years as we had hoped, uh, but may not be available to us after next year. Sort of depends on how things are going. So they're really anxious to begin to figure out um, how first to, to let all of us know that this is coming that uh, managing our waste will be more expensive, and then to help us figure out how to reduce the amount of waste that we have to throw out and get more of it recycled and, well, less of it um, into our homes in the first place, as, uh, and businesses and municipal uh, offices. So watch this space. Can you tell us how the survey results were? I don't know if that's still going on or if that ended. Um, oh, it was presented. Um, uh, no, I, I don't remember <coughs> well enough. Um, there was a fairly good response. I do remember that. Um, and there's some discussion about how to interpret, um, you know, everything. But um, you know, the long and short of it is that um, it's going to be a lot more expensive. And uh, <coughs> we will have to deal with it. Indeed. Somehow. Okay. Thank you. Other ladies on reports for tonight? Mr. Wade? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Wald. <laughs> that was Wald and Hayden together. Right. <laughs> We're often confused. Sorry. <laughs> I'm very confused right now. Uh, just briefly, public art uh, calendar alert, biennial, end of the first week in October. Should have great weather and great art. Uh, and the Historical Commission just wanted to mention that some residents of North Amherst came before the commission to make, to indicate their desire to look into the possibility of creating a local historic district on the model of the one that was approved for the Dickinson district in town meeting. Uh, I've been talking to various people in the precinct, so there are some people who are very much for it and some who are very much against it. We've received some mail about that. Just so you know, I'm trying to see what's going on, gather information, whatever we can do to smooth things out. The National Trust for Historic Preservation picked up the story with a basically contentless and not very helpful piece. <laughs> Uh, you would, nothing they couldn't have gotten out of Scott Smirch's box, much better articles, which I recommend to people instead, but anyway. I'm sure it'll be in the news again as the, as the weeks come. Oh, th th I sh what I should say, though, is that as far as I can tell from Town Hall, the Planning Department wants to get the Dickinson District nailed down first, so they're not rushing to start something new before they finish the old. So it's not an urgent matter. It's just something that's coming up through the pipeline. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Ms. Burr. Um, very briefly, because what few meetings there have been in many respects, I haven't gone to um, because I've decided to take up my time apparently with the Regional School District Planning Board work, which is uh, proceeding apace, and anybody <laughs> wants to ask me about it, we'll talk about that another time. More specifically, CDBG hearings, um, there was just one on reprogramming capital money. We've seen this happen before where we have these great ideas of things we're going to buy, and unfortunately, we People don't always want to sell them to us, and so then we have to reprogram the money so we don't lose it. And so they just had a hearing on that. They are all geared up for their set of hearings associated with both social service and non-social service, i.e. capital projects. So that's proceeding apace. Um, they've issued a release saying we are soliciting proposals, et cetera. So that is all going along very smoothly. And I also wanted to mention that the housing consultant that was solicited um, through will town manager can speak to this better than I can. Clearly at this hour, I'm not speaking to anything clearly, but the Housing and Sheltering Committee, which as you know is a fairly new committee, um, is going to be meeting with that consultant soon. They're gonna be working out a way because we decided that that, made, that was the place that made sense for the public to feed into the consultant because the consultant isn't trying to, you know, make some great vision for Amherst. They're mostly collecting facts, but to make sure that they're collecting all the facts, we wanted to have them speak with a group associated with housing. And so the Housing and Sheltering Committee is doing that, and any uh, neighborhoods that have piped up and asked for concerns associated with that are being directed to work through the Housing and Sheltering Committee, and that seems to be going along just swimmingly. So they've met several times this summer, despite being new, and um, are coming right along. 
The other thing I wanted to mention associated with historical stuff is that as we have seen as select board members, but the public may not be aware that we are um, still in the process of soliciting applications for the Dickinson um, Historic District Commission with the various you know, caveats knowing that various representation is expected on that. But we haven't been getting like gobs of applications. So if there were people out there that were interested in that, they should go to the town website and that information is right there so that they can apply because they can't start doing anything until there's commission appointed and not too many people have applied for it yet. But it is summer. Okay. Anyone else on liaison reports to Mr. Winslow? Reynolds Winslow again, Precinct 1. Uh, it's an inquiry I have to request if the uh, select board has made a, a judgment on two students for the Human Rights Commission that uh, their credentials have been submitted, but I have not uh, been informed that they have both been approved. We approved both of those at the they early part of the meeting. meeting. That, that happened? Very early, That's yes. Right. Okay, Apologize. I promised them that it would happen today, <laughs> but uh, it, it did. did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Good night. I'm terribly sorry you had to sit here all night waiting for that. If I oh, would have been happy to indicate that. a bunch of things and did them very fast, and I'm sorry you missed it. Yeah, it, for untimed items, just so folks know, we use untimed items to fill in all the gaps between our timed items as necessary. So untimed items don't come at the end of the meeting necessarily. They come absolutely every place we can plug them in so that we can keep to the timed items as best we can. So my great apologies to you. I was just going to say, so if they wanted to hear us mispronounce their names, that would be fairly early in the meeting that we did that. <laughs> if they want to turn on which the rebroadcast. Which I did, probably. Which I did as well, so. It's done. Okay, um, so other liaison reports. I'll just note, note the Campus and Community Coalition, so I've already referred to that. Uh, th they've done a tremendous amount of work, as you might imagine, getting ready for the new school year and uh, as part of what I was talking about earlier with safe and healthy neighborhoods, trying to get the message out better about exactly what that work is. Um, I hope to present you kind of a more formal review of that at the next meeting. And I think that's the only thing I have to report on. Uh, open meeting law update, can we wait till next time for that? And really, all I can say is, yes, we can certainly wait on it for next time because it really doesn't change anything they already told us, except, uh, okay, you can, yeah, it's nothing. So <laughs> it's still a discussion we'll have at a future time about whether or not we're going to do remote participation. But unlike occasions when they have just totally changed the way they're looking at something, this is just more of the same. Did we mention this chair's report? and how much we are all glad we didn't have to do this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was what I was getting to next, the chair's report if we're done with liaison report. So I'm not gonna go through this, um, but I, uh, it's, it's important for you to know what the chair does yeah. on your behalf. So there's just the regular committee stuff and various meetings that happen, but, but some things you wouldn't know what I was doing unless I told you, and because we haven't met in so long, I thought it was easiest to just give you a list. Um, as I said, I'm not gonna go through these things. The, there's, a, there's a heavy theme here of dealing with the university. That really is kind of the thing that I spend the most time on, um, and, uh, and I couldn't have better partners to work with on that at, at the university, so it's very gratifying. Um, but so I just wanted to make sure that you y'all had this information to to have kind of a picture of, of what I'm doing on your behalf. And if you have any concerns, you should really let me know. <laughs> um, so I think that's it for the chair's report. You can just note that for whatever to whatever degree that is interesting. Um, do we have any other untimed items that we didn't get to tonight? Yeah. That I'm aware of. Minutes, I think. Minutes, I which I don't think we have. Anticipate. So we got all of our motions, is that right? Right. We do. Okay. So the Except minutes that the are in our packet weren't for approval. Those were just um, okay. those were parts of right. other issues. Right. Um, We've approved them already. Oh, this has approved as an untimed items. That's uh, right. Yeah. It's just That's boilerplate. Placeholder, it's always yeah. there in case we need it. Okay, so I think that we have done everything, in which case it's time for the executive session motion, which I will make, and I will note that um, one element was left out of the motion. Um, uh, so I move to enter into executive session in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21, Part 2. Part 2 is missing from the motion, but it is on the uh, agenda which is to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel, being town manager John P. Musanti, and the select board will not reconvene an open meeting following the close of executive session. I need a roll call vote to go into executive Second. session. Second. Aye, aye. Hayden, aye. 
Then uh, this uh, meeting adjourns to executive session at 9.51 p.m. I repeat, we are not coming back in open session, and the select board will meet again here in this room on Monday, September 10th. Thank you all very much, and happy Labor Day and back to school.